Hey, and we are live. Welcome to Fresh Fit Podcast, guys. We're here with Andrew Dude. fucking Tate. Man. Andrew Tate, I'm back. The one on one. It hasn't. It's only been a couple days, but it's been too long. <laughs> Yo, part two, the solo interview. Andrew Tate, let's go. Let's, let's go. go. Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome back to the Fresh Fit Podcast. We're here with the legendary Andrew Tate, aka Cobra Tate, man. Yeah, legendary man. now. I, I, I will say this. Ever since you were here a couple months back, by far the most requested guests were you and AMS. Yeah. By far. You need to bring Andrew back. You need to bring Andrew back. That was awesome. But I was actually, like, they do polls on Reddit, Twitter, Instagram. Yeah. Who was the best guest on Fresh and Fit? Guess what they said? <laughs> Andrew Tate. Yeah, oh, man. man so. I'm just out here surviving, trying to stay on the right side of the dirt, my friends. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I'm, if I'm spitting knowledge, it's, it's nothing but life experience. That's all it is. It's nothing more than that. But I'm glad I can help people. I'm glad people resonate with the words I say. So I love to be here. I love to be on the Fresh and Fit. And big ups, man. You made the Spotify. Biggest podcast off the record academics. That's hey. huge, bro. That's huge. Man. And it was your birthday too, by the and way, man. And it's my birthday. Yeah, and I'm tall and strong and sexy and rich. <laughs> Life's good. Winning. Life's good. <laughs> Just winning always. We are ten subs away from hitting 500k. Ten mm. subs. Ten mm. subs, man. Yo, ten, ten subs, subs to the channel, guys. And we will God, announce damn. the the party soon. But yes. Andrew. Welcome back, brother. Hey, man. I'm Welcome glad back. to be here. I'm, I'm glad to be alive when you're gonna have half a million. Fresh and fit soldiers. I, <laughs> I'm here at the right time, right place, right time. It's like the story of my life. Back, so, uh, yeah, look forward to being here. And, and once again, to you guys, honestly, neither of you get enough credit. You must be the hardest working YouTubers. You're not, you're not messing around with some cheap channel. you got a serious studio. You guys are working day in, day out. I'm like, guys, let's come to the club. I got all the bitches. I got the balls. I'm spending money. Fit's like, nah, I can't. I got work to do. Fresh is like, okay, I'm on my way. But... <laughs> <laughs> Network, baby. Network. Yeah. <laughs> but no, you guys are hardworking. You deserve it. You deserve the success. Thanks, brother. Yeah, man. No, I appreciate it, Andrew. And um, yeah, so like I was saying before, man, if there's one person that's been requested more than anyone else has by far been Andrew. When last time you came on, set the world on fire because a lot of people didn't know who you were and we're like you guys don't know who andrew tate is man like what the fuck put like, him on the map bro wait wait wait, yeah, wait, wait man so, wait, like what the hell is wrong with that. you guys wait Chris, sorry we sorry. just hit it right sorry andrew we hit 500k <laughs> we need some, we need some aikido, alcohol or something aikido, aikido. Aikido. aikido we can bust out the aikido my life's aikido we can bust out the aikido 500k aikido we got nunchucks oh we got a sword we got a sword as well sword. wait where'd this come from we got, we got a bunch of random shit here Nigga, nah, what? Come on, come on. Oh shit! What, what is it? Are we gonna? Oh, oh what damn! On, what are we doing? Here, what? What are we doing? I don't. I don't Aikido. even know what's going on. Like oh, Aikido. Aikido. Aikido? Oh yeah. shit! Wait, no, you hold this, nigga. Oh. No, 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 you hold it. No, you hold it. So yeah, make sure to hit him. No, no, no. kick him when you kick him bro, when you do it. it no, 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 you hold it. I got busted. All right, that's what I have to do. Oh shit! Put it off. Put it up. Don't be afraid, Fresh. Don't be afraid. <laughs> oh! oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Four time kickboxing world oh, champion shit. of the fucking house. Yo, uh. Oh, that was scary, bro. Do you have a uh, Casamigo something to pop on, on our screen? Damn. Don't worry. We got some We got some booze. It's coming right now. Don't worry. Oh, right. Lord. As you can tell, viewers, <laughs> we need alcohol. You know, yeah. when we're sober, we're too calm. Oh, yeah, God. we're too calm. So we need a little bit of drink. It'd be worse. We need something to drink. Guys, oh, man. Shout out to that. Imagine man. a fist star kick coming for Andrew. You should run for your life. Yeah, no, that's crazy. <laughs> Listen, you know, Every fresh and fair. Now I'm keeping these on the table, just in case you know, just in case you go bust them out. You keep the cameras on. You remember that Bruce Lee? You know that Bruce Lee scene where he stands in the middle with the nunchucks from Enter the Dragon, and they, and they all come at him just one by one. Yeah, I'll give you some Patreon content. <laughs> I'll show you. Let's do it. Oh man. So um, and once so yeah. again, man, thank you guys for supporting us, man. You guys were just from some of you were here from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. This is me and Myron in the studio. Sorry, outside the studio at our our spots. And then Andrew came along as well, supported us as well. So to everyone in the chat, the mods, everybody, appreciate y'all, man. Yeah, Andrew was with us from the from the rip. He did an interview with you Actually, on your channel yo, a long ass even, time ago. He didn't even know who I was. I said, "Yo, Andrew, you, uh, you inspire me. You you motivate you you kind of like motivate me, bro." And he joined on, on the channel. He said, "You know what? I got some some, some time for you, G. I hop on." He didn't even know who I was, bro. So that's much love, man. Yeah, man. I I I. You know what? The universe is a funny place. Without sounding too woo woo and too the secret, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, yeah. you do get back what you give out to some degree, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I try and be as positive as possible. Now, obviously there's a, occasionally I have to get the yoga fire out on the motherfucker. <laughs> but most of the time I try and be a positive guy, right? It's amazing how far you can get if you're likable and you're positive and you spread positive energy and it usually comes back to you twofold. So uh, yeah, you reached out to me. I remember you reaching out to me. You said the things you want to talk about. You said, look, you're an inspiration. You do X, Y, Z. And I said, yeah, let's talk. Why not? You know, so, um, and look where we are. Now look we're here 500K. Are it's, so crazy, it's crazy, right? It's crazy. And you know what we have in common? We're both likable. 
That this, trait is hard mm-hmm. to find. Andrew, well, I, was, yeah, I was about to make a joke to say one of us. Yeah. <laughs> 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 like, no, but I mean, uh, but no, man, by far, you know, it, it's great to have you back. You know, last time we had the show, we had you on the show. It went viral. People loved it, you know, because you have a very outspoken personality. I mean, me and you agree on like 99 percent of uh, things. Yeah. And uh, it, it's fantastic because, you know, you, you walk the walk and you talk, you talk the talk and you walk the walk, man. You're a very successful guy. You know what I'm saying? You've you've killed it with, when it comes to business, athletics, your personal life. Uh, and you're a very accomplished individual, and it's fantastic to have you back on the show, man. One, by far the most requested guest, so we're happy to give you guys this one-on-one interview. I'm going to tell you all this. It's going to be uncensored. You're going to hear the rants. We're going to shut the hell up and let them talk. Abraham, 10 bucks. Andrew, have you shown Luke how the real world works yet? Eggs aren't real. <laughs> Eggs aren't real. That's a long story. I was I was in Spain driving through the mountains in a McLaren, running from the police, and I discovered the eggs this whole time. Eggs are not real. And, and I know you're looking at me like, what are you talking about? But I'm, I'm telling story. you, it's a myth. It's a conspiracy. It's explained on Take Confidential. Mm, I'm going to write that down here. Eggs aren't real. Uh, you believe in eggs? <laughs> no, the chicken came first. No, but do you believe in eggs? I eat eggs. You eat them. So you're telling me you can buy this thing. It's an egg. It's like a dollar. No, a dollar, you get like 10 of them. Yeah. And they can become dinosaurs if you don't eat them. Mm. That sounds, that makes sense to you. Chickens. Bruv. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so, Andrew, for the people that don't know, who you are. Can you please introduce yourself to the audience, man? You know, every time I'm asked to do this, I have so many paths to choose because I've lived such an eclectic life, right? Mm-hmm. I can talk in 10 different directions to describe myself. So it's it's kind of difficult. I guess, not I guess, I'm the thing I'm most proud of. My largest accolade is that I am a four-time kickboxing world champion. I fought for Infusion. I fought for Glory. I fought for K1. 87 fights, 79 wins. And those most of those fuckers who beat me, I beat. One of them escaped. And if I ever see him on the streets on site, but uh, everyone else got a whooping and uh, that was a long, hard career. And it's kind of amazing where a lot of people ask me how I know the things I know. And fighting taught me a lot of it. Fighting taught me a lot about girls, a lot about business, a lot about the world, um, taking fighting seriously, because I was never really a school guy. I never really went to school, never took school seriously. Um, So I was always just trying to get some money and beat people up. And here we are. I got a bunch of money and I beat a bunch of people up. So life's going well. (laughs) Sun world champion, multimillionaire, nice guy. Nice guy, don't forget that. Uh, Wudan Master. That's how I did, that's how I introduced myself. I don't know what else to say. AKA James Bond in real life. You know, maybe a little bit. I watched the last Bond movie, spoiler alert. I watched the last Bond movie and I saw them kill him off. And they had to kill him off, right? Because what Bond was, Bond was a pimp. And pimping is frowned upon in the modern society. And when I say he's a pimp, Bond spoke to my soul. Because James Bond's probably the only other person I saw out here in the world who was fucking for everything other than sex, right? Most dudes get a chick and they want to get sex to get sex. Bond gets a chick and he wants to get sex. So she tells him where the safe of the bad guy is. So she tells him about the bad guy because she's fucking the bad guy too. He's fucking her purely to get shit. He doesn't want to have sex. He's giving her sex to get something back. And when I watched that, I was like, man, that's, that's me. That, that's that's my whole life. The finesse. Uh, bro, the finesse, bro. I look at a girl and be like, look, I, whether I was running my cam business at the time and I wanted her to work for me, or even today, females make fantastic spies. I'll say it right here, out here in the open. I have female spies who work for me to this day. I have girls I can send to the right boat, the right party at the right time. They come back with field reports. Because most dudes won't shut up around a chick. They just can't be quiet about all the amazing things they've done, right? Females make fantastic spies. But if I want a female to spy for me and to work for me and to stay loyal to me, money won't do it. I can't pay her to be a spy because if she's banging some other dude, that's who she's loyal to. So if I want her to be loyal to me and to report to me, the only way that's going to happen is if she gets, am I allowed to say dick? Say it. The dick. Facts. So that's the game. So Bond was a pimp. So when I watched them kill him off, it was kind of emotional for me. You know, like imagine I'm driving in my Rolls Royce Wraith black badge, going to the cinema, trying to have a nice night, a couple bitches. I watched the Bond movie, and it's like I watched myself die. <laughs> I'm driving home in my Rolls with my hose, and they're like, what's the matter? I'm like, bitch, you know, you don't know what's the matter. The world's changing. Men like me are no longer liked. We can't even be in fiction anymore, Thanks. men like me. Mm-hmm. So if they're going to kill men like me from fiction, they're certainly going to try and kill men like me from reality, right? I have to be exceptionally careful. And when I say kill, I don't necessarily mean broad daylight assassination. What I mean is character assassination. What I mean is warping the minds of the public to the point where I'm a bad guy for being a heterosexual male who likes to fuck. 
oh, oh he's a misogynist. Uh, uh. Listen, if I was gay and I was out here saying, listen, there's no, I, I want any man I want, blah, blah, I'd be celebrated. Yeah. But because I'm, because I'm heterosexual and I say, look, I like to fuck. Now I'm a bad guy, right? Facts. It's crazy. So they're just going to character assassinate. They're going to try and convince the world that anyone who is true to their masculine entity and the masculine imperative is, an, is a bad person in, instinctually. And they're going to, uh, the people who exist like me, the very few that are left, we're not going to exist in a few more generations. Yeah. That James Bond thing hurt me. It upset me. I had to park the rolls. I mean, I fucked the hose. You know, I'm, I'm okay again. You made a video about it. But it was a sad day for me. It yeah. was a very, very sad day. Yeah, it was a sad day. Can you tell us a little bit about um, your father and your upbringing? Because a, a lot of people always ask, well, Andrew, how'd you get these world views? How, why do you view the world the way that you do? And I'm a firm believer that obviously, you know, your parents have a huge um, impact on you as far as how you view the world. And, and your dad had a very interesting um, his background. My dad was the OG. And uh, I actually put uh, something on Twitter the other day that went viral and pissed everyone off. Why is it everything I say annoys everybody? <laughs> I'm just trying to live my life, no you know, I, and I just try and say something and everyone's like, what? No, no. So I said the other day that any child who's obsessed with superheroes, that's a warning sign to the father. And the warning sign is that when I was a child, the only superhero I was interested in talking to or being around was my dad. Like if I saw, if I watched Batman and I go to my dad and say, Hey, do you see what Batman did? My dad would sit me down and go, fuck that. Listen to what I've done. Mm. My dad was my hero. In every way. I had no interest in fiction because I had a real life superhero. Until the day he died, I viewed him as a superhero. So my, my dad was an exceptional character and he raised me in an exceptional manner. And although there's too many stories to tell, the one thing my father was fantastic at was prioritizing the mindset of my brother and I above even his relationship with my mother. Mm -hmm. So because there's so many dudes who end up being cucked out in their own household because they don't want to argue with the wife. And the sons see that shit. I was never raised around that. My dad would disappear to chess tournaments for two months. He'd go off. And my father was one of the best chess players in the world. Right. He'd, this is before like cell phones and stuff, right? So he'd, he'd call home twice a week, whatever. He's gone for two months. He walks in the door. My mom's like, Emery, where you been? It's been two months. I don't know where you've been. What is this? I've gone through your clothes. There's a picture of some bitch in your... Da -da -da. And my dad, <laughs> my dad had been home for 42 minutes. And he'd just go, sorry, son. She won't shut up walked out again <laughs> see you in two months Whoa. that's just who he was he's like i ain't sitting there taking shit off a bitch i'm that that's it i'm not gonna take it doesn't matter if she's your mother i love your mother i love you i'm not sitting here taking shit and it's kind of like you grow up around that and now when i come home after two months <laughs> and she's trying to say where you been you've been in fresh and fit podcast i watched the podcast you with all them girls i'm like bitch I gotta go back to Miami, man. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I, I was raised around. I had a fantastic upbringing. I, I I can't say anything bad about either of my parents. My mother as well. I was raised with no money and good parents, and that's the best way you can possibly Fact. be. Same raised. here, man. Best way you can be raised. Your yep. father was African American, and your mother was Caucasian. Yeah, my mother is white Irish. So my dad was in the Air Force. He was based in Chick Sands Air Force Base, which is in the UK. Mm -hmm. He was pimping all these British chicks. Caught himself a cutie. Hey. And uh, that was the beginning of. The legendary Tate brothers. So it was me, my brother. I've got a sister as well. So uh, there's us three. And uh, we moved back to England. We lived in America for a while until I was around 10. And then we moved back to the UK. And I was pretty much raised in England. What do you yeah, prefer, so. America or the UK? They're, they're good for different things, man. Mm. But um, they both have the same basic, the same basic worldviews, the same basic, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Propaganda. Propaganda. The same, they're trying to hypnotize you in the same way, right? And it's all done on purpose. I think we've discussed this before and we'll discuss it certainly a bit later, but they're trying to destroy the masculine imperative to prevent revolution. So it's all kind of the same. There's certain things I respect about each country, um, but it was good to certainly at a young age move around a bit as well. It, it allowed me to never ever really settle in a school and make a bunch of good friends or anything like that. So I always understood even from a young age how to make people like me quickly and also how unimportant the relationships with those people were. Right. I wasn't a kid who's like, oh, I'm going to miss my best friend. I was like, OK, you're my best friend for two years. Peace. I'm out. I was like that. So that's probably another reason why me and my brother are so close. So, yeah, it was a good upbringing. I can't have nothing bad to say about it. I was just raised by the OG. My dad was a G. Big, black, chess master, huge, drinking, gambling, pimping. Like, he's just out here. He was just that guy. Right. <laughs> so he was like that to the end. So he was a hero. And um, and you ended up, you know, taking after your father and playing chess at a high level as well. Correct. Yeah. Well, what draws you to chess? 
because I grew up playing chess as well. So yeah, so chess. I mean, obviously, my father was a chess master, right? So I had to I had to learn the game. He sat me down. I spent a lot of time learning it. And to this day, I have massive respect for chess. So much respect for the game. It's so much harder at that world level than people can even fathom. Unless you even play the game, you can't even anticipate how good these people are at the game. They're, they're effectively computers. I don't think you can even be good at chess at that level without having something a little bit wrong with you. you got to be on the spectrum somewhere. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Because it's crazy how good these guys are. But yeah, chess is an amazing thing. I still play chess every day. I'm, I'm not world level or anything. I'm around 1750, 1800 ELO. Um, if anyone knows chess, that's what I am. But yeah, it, it would that be considered uh, better than average? High, higher certainly, team? certainly better than average. Yeah. You know, it's, the average player, let's say, is around a thousand or something. Okay. okay. But my dad was twenty four hundred. Okay. Twenty five hundred. Damn. Okay. So yeah. So I, I'll give you an example. My dad could beat me without looking at the board. So my dad would be in the kitchen, fucking around the kitchen, cooking dinner. I'd be in front of a chessboard in the living room, and I'd say e four. He'd say c c six. Knight f three. Knight c three. God and damn. Boom, and he'd damn. smoke me without looking at the board. That's how good Shit. the best. It's, it's, wow. it's insanity. Yeah. But um, I do think it's a good basis for life. There's certainly a lot of lessons in chess. There's certainly a lot you can attribute to chess from from everyday life to the chess board. And I think it's a good it's a good grounding mechanism. I enjoy to sit down for a good couple hours, win some games, lose some games. Right. It's something I personally enjoy. So, yeah, can you tell more. tell us some of those uh, life lessons that you learned from playing chess with your father and applying it into real life? Yeah, absolutely. So. Uh, I'll give you my favorite one first. Yeah. Please do. My favorite one is, is the difference between the king and the queen. Mm. Right? Because the king moves one square at a time. And the queen can just zip across the board. Right? So you're here in Miami. You're partying in Miami. They got all these parties right now. It's Art Basel, blah, blah, blah. You see all these chicks on a boat. For the man to get on that boat, it's one square at a time. Right? He has to get a good job. He has to get his taxes right. He has to find a way to leverage credit. He has to meet the guy who sells the boats. He has to go through all this shit stage by stage by stage to finally pull off being on that yacht and having that yacht at the age of 56. A chick, what does she need? Lip fillers? <laughs> Boom. Zip. On. She gets straight on. Mm -hmm. That's the difference between the king and the queen. But although the king is slower than the queen, he's the most important piece, right? The king can't die. The queen can die. The queen, sometimes you can be looking at a position and go, this is fucked up. The only way out of this is to sacrifice that bitch. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you can do it. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you a very quick story. This is a story I've never told before. When I was, how old was I, 23? When I was 23, I was dating a ballerina. She was the prima ballerina of the Cambridge Ballet School in England. And I had no money. I was a fighter, but I was coming up. I didn't really have any money. And she lived far away, like an hour and a half away. But she used to come see me, and we were good for like a year, year and a half. I love this girl, yeah? And uh, she finished ballet school. She started dancing in clubs in London. She couldn't get any ballet work. So five, surprise, surprise. Who fucking wants ballet work, right? So she ends up doing like dancing and uh, not stripping, but like dancing in the club, you know. Da -da. So now she's around all the, mo the London money every day. She's out dancing all the time. She's up late every night. She doesn't want to drive an hour and a half to come see me. None of this shit. So we're kind of falling apart a little bit. And uh, she ended up talking to someone famous, David Hay. I don't know who he is. He's a boxer. Mm -hmm. So David Hay starts texting this bitch, right? Back and forth to the... So anyway, when I finally saw her again, she was like, we had an argument. She's like, well, you know what? You think you're a fighter? This guy, that guy, this guy, that guy. I'm like, look, if you're going to go fuck idiots, at least do it for money. And she's like, what do you mean? I was like, well, if you're going to go fuck idiots, at least get paid because they don't give a fuck about you. Like, if you're going to play this game, at least do it for money. Right. So I had this argument with her back and forth, and I explained to her that these men are just going to use you. If you're going to do it, at least get paid. And when she left the house, Tristan said, why are you telling her to fuck other dudes? I'm like, no, I'm just understanding that in my chess position, I've lost this game. Right. Mm. The game is done now. Just sooner or later, she's out. All we do is argue. She's in the club every night. I'm just trying to say before she leaves, maybe I can get a little bit of money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. That's the queen sacrifice, right? Right, right. She, we, we broke up three months later. I don't know if she fucked him or not or who she fucked. I don't know. I never spoke to her since. But that's kind of the, the analogy you have to be able to apply to life. Sometimes chicks got to go. Yeah. Sometimes they have to go to save the king. And uh, too many dudes, most of the time, men truly lose at life. It's because they've attached themselves to a queen and they won't let her up. They won't sacrifice her. No, no matter what. I promised I'm going to stick by you. This, our marriage vows, no matter what, no matter what. And they just stay on that sinking ship till she eventually leaves his ass. And it's yeah. it's sad to see, but men keep doing it. I so. want to add one thing to that because I've literally used a chess example uh, like uh, last week with some girls. And I mentioned how when women are young and beautiful, they're kind of like a queen on the board. They can go in any direction, as many spaces as they choose. Yep. But if the king dies, the game is over. If 100%. he's surrounded, it's over. So if your woman doesn't sit there by your side and protect you from the bullshit because you're out there getting it, 100%. right? 
the game is over. Even now, worse, what most queens do, queens, I don't want to use queens, what most women do nowadays, especially in the West, yeah. I see women getting their men in trouble all the time. You know how many times I've seen chicks start in fights for their dude to have to mop up? My man's going to be, be, be. And yep. the man's like, oh, fuck. Shut up, man. Yep. There's, there's four of them. Yep. Do you know what I mean? Like, even if he's a big dude, he's like, I don't really need this now today. Yep. You know what I'm saying? Man, I, I, another story. I have so many stories in my life. My life's been cool. <laughs> Back around the same time, I'm 22, 23 years old, kickboxer. I was British champion. I wasn't world champion at the time. It was four in the morning. The club just ended. I was in a chicken and chip shop. It's an English thing. They sell like fries and fried chicken and, and they're open 24 hours. Like, yeah, something like that. Mm -hmm. And there's a long line. Uh, an Audi with tinted windows pulls up. These three big black guys get out push it straight in front of the whole line, go straight up to the front, cut in front of five people and start ordering. My girl goes to me, we've been waiting here ages. I said, shut the fuck up. <laughs> shut the fuck up. She goes, are you just going to let them push it? I said, shut the fuck up. So I made her be quiet, right? Anyway, the man two, two in front of me, not this guy, the guy here, he couldn't tell this bitch to shut up. She's like, excuse me, excuse me, there's a line. And the guy turns around and goes, you think I don't see the fucking line? I don't care about a fucking line. So she starts running her mouth, bro, this dude, Knocked her the fuck out. Oh, man. Whack. Clean. Out cold. By the time her man looked at her and looked back up, boom. Sparked. Done. Whoa. Both of them. And I stood there and watched both of them just laid out clean. Yeah, fatalities, bro. It was, it was, I wouldn't be surprised if they both had permanent damage. It was bad. The, the three dudes who ordered the chicken and chips didn't even take their food. They started laughing, walked back out, got in the car. And I turned around and said to my girl, you see, some people are just ready to fucking go to jail. Some people are ready to kill people over fucking nothing. You want me to fight? Oh, yeah, I can fight. But what am I fighting these three dudes for? What, fries? Yeah. What, fries Ooh. and a 10-minute delay? Damn. Man, and this is what bitches will get you into this shit. Yeah. Bitches will get you into this shit fast. And that's why when I see dudes saying, oh, yeah, she's just my friend. You're hanging around with girls, and they're not even giving you pussy, and they might get your ass killed. What the fuck is wrong with you, with man? Girls are a liability. They're a liability to have around you because you have a duty to protect them in some regard. I curate my experience very, very carefully. Any woman I'm around, I understand I have to protect. So she better suck something. <laughs> I ain't fucking sitting around being friends with no bitch. Because I've seen it. I've seen it. I've seen so many men have their ass kicked over chicks. It's, inc it's incredible. And I'll say this too, just to because I, I got to double down on that. Women are unaware, especially in the Western world, of the fury and damage and carnage men are capable of. Because okay. they live in a coddled first world country where men rarely raise their hand to and or and, uh, conduct acts of violence against women. So sometimes you have to be reminded of the stark contrast between the male superiority physically and the female inferiority physically. And sometimes it happens with them getting knocked out or whatever. Another thing too, I want to let the guys know that's watching the show is that women are always replaceable. If you go back to the chessboard, all you got to do is get your pawn across that's and right. she turns into, and the pawn turns into a queen. That's right. And I need you guys to understand that you can take a pawn and turn her into a queen, but if the queen allows you to be surrounded, the game is over. And I need guys to take literally value themselves like the chess piece, man. So, 100, 100 percent. Going after that story as well. So, funny thing, right? I had a friend. I was dating this chick, and he's gone over her a couple of times. And she had an ex boyfriend that was crazy, right? Mm -hmm. So he ends up taking her to his, his restaurant where he works at. God forbid <laughs> this happens to anybody else, but like they go to his restaurant and they're sitting down. The boyfriend's watching the whole thing going on. His ex girl's there with her new man. Yeah. He's plotting. Man, he's the chef. So he's cooking up food, doing a bunch of shit. <laughs> Nigga put poison or something in his food. Wow. Fucked him up. Come to find out later, he 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 almost died. Wow. So it's like, girl, you're right, bro. Girls could fuck you up, bro. Even oh, though you you have annoying. Oh, hundred percent, man. They're, they're, they're a liability, and, and it's not necessarily just completely their fault. Yeah. But if you're rolling with a chick who won't shut up when you tell her to shut up, you need to be careful, man. And and Myron nailed it. There's a big difference between fighting and violence. Yeah. Like I'm a professional fighter, right? I know how to fight. But fighting and violence are different things. Yep. If I wanted to get violent on somebody, I'd just run them the fuck over. Like that's forget fighting, right? If someone, if somebody who hurt my family was on the sidewalk, I'm not gonna get out and fight the guy. I'm just gonna just run him over my fucking truck. We'll talk about violence. You know, violence is a very different thing. And women don't understand the difference between fighting and pure violence. And they also, you're completely right. They don't understand the true physical difference between a man and a woman. Yeah. All this female self-defense, I can fight too. It's all bullshit. Mm -hmm. It's complete garbage. A man who's genuinely enraged, you don't stand a chance. I'm sorry. The best thing you can do is scream and run. I'll tell you another example. Even a teenage boy. Oh, no. You don't stand a chance. a grown yeah. woman. I had a girl who did uh, self-defense classes. This is like a couple years ago. And she goes, oh, you're a kickboxer. I want to show you like my self-defense. And if you grab me, I do this, I do this, I do this. I said, listen, bitch. <laughs> if I grab you and you start trying to be a little ninja, what I'm going to do is I'm going to fucking smash you. Whack, 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 whack. 
done. Now your whole face is busted. Like you, you, you forget the, the part of the equation where I just beat you up mm. for like three seconds and you're done. Now drag your ass to the bushes. What the fuck are you talking about? Mm. It's garbage, man. I'll give me another example of a guy I saw get fucked up because of this chick. I was outside a club in England. And one more thing for the American guys watching this. Anyone who thinks England's like, you know, nice suits and little posh people. England, Shanks. Hey, bro, England's violent. Very dangerous. Shanks, Shanks, very, very, very dangerous. Yeah. I would actually say, although you have guns here, I'd say the mentality as a whole is more dangerous there. People are about it. They're just a crazy island, and they always have been. So it's a very dangerous place. Stabbing people takes another, it's another element. You know, shooting someone is one thing, but yeah. like being up close and stabbing someone? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and that's it, all day, every day. Look up yeah. London knife crime. You can look up the statistics now. I think they have 15,000 stabbings a year. They call it chefing. Yeah. yeah. They call it chefing. Yeah. So, uh, I'll chef them off. Bro. Chef them off. Yeah, yeah. Chef G. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I have it missing here. I don't know if you can zoom in. My finger came off from a blade. Oh, all shit. All the way off. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's, that's a long story. I was walking to a car late at night. And I was arguing with the, I don't know if you can see the scar there. Had yeah. to be sewn back on. God damn. So uh, I, I'm mixing stories now, but yeah, I, was, okay. I, I had arguments with the guy by text. He stopped replying. Two days later, as I walked to my car at night, they tried to kill me. And that also shows a lot about intent, right? Because when they with intent, they don't threaten. That shows you how, you know, I was arguing with the guy and he goes, all right, just stop replying. And that shows true intent because he tried to kill me. That's another story I can't say on Fresh and Fit. But uh, <laughs> I, I saw a dude get knocked the fuck out again. Even when women have the best intentions, they're a liability. I saw a guy outside a nightclub. He's arguing with another guy. His chick's in the way going, leave it, leave it, stop, stop, don't do it. Da, da. Be in the way, being a fucking idiot. Anyway, she holds, she grabs her guy, like, go, stop, stop, holds onto his right arm. Stop, stop. Boom, he gets knocked out. Oh. You're holding on your dude's arm. How the fuck's he going to fight? Even if you don't want him to fight, you're just going to hold on his arm saying, stop, 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 and let him get sparked? I tell my chicks all the time, if we're walking down the street and any kind of altercation comes, run and fucking scream. Fuck off. You're no good to me next to me. You're, you're no good to me in between. You're no good to me next to me. You're no good to me shouting stop. You're no good to me holding on to me. Just fuck off. Run over there and scream and get somebody else and leave it to me. Even if there's a hundred of them, leave me by myself because these chicks will get you fucked up, especially the ones who aren't trained. And even if they have the best intentions, if they panic, what are they going to do? They're going to grab you because you're their man, right? Oh, oh, oh. They're going to stop you from being able to fight. Yeah. They're a fucking liability. Dudes, you're walking out here with chicks and they're untrained. At least my chicks are trained. I literally will sit down with girls and say, look, if something goes off, especially where I live in the world, Romania, these kind of countries, if something goes off, run and scream. Don't be trying to fucking hit, fight, none of that shit. Get the fuck out of here. Or she might even get knocked on herself. Yeah, just get the fuck out of here. Yeah. Yep. So, it's, man. So. All right, so I'll read these real quick. I hope you guys enjoyed the fucking heat. High IQ conversation. Keep six uh, archives. Mind match per spasat. You know what? This is your father's This state, is right? my father's quote. Go ahead. Should I, should I tell you the story quickly? Yeah, tell us the story on that one. All right, so I'm with my dad. My dad. My dad's a chess player, but he's also like a park hustler, right? So, like, he'd go to the, the parks and play chess against the other chess guys to make quick money. So he'd go in there and offer him ridiculous odds, like three to one, four to one, give them more time, whatever. And he'd sit down at the park and he'd, and he'd bust them up. My dad was really good at chess, but he was ultra aggressive. Mm -hmm. So like grandmasters hated playing him. A few times he lost spectacularly because he went too hard, but there's some few times he had crushing victories, like just wrecked the grandmaster because he just went completely all out defenseless. He was like an attacking player. Damn. So uh, I remember I was about eight years old. I told this story on my tape speech, my YouTube channel. I was about eight years old. Yeah, I read it and I was like, that's definitely your father's Yeah, yeah, yeah. Story. I was about eight years old. And my dad, even when he was still alive, because I only speak English, right? Even though I live in Romania. Mm -hmm. And I said to my dad, do you think I should learn another language? And he sat, he turned to me and said, you don't even speak English. And what he meant is most people don't even have a, a grasp of the English language. Think how many words are in English you don't even know, right? So his, what he was saying to me is you don't need to learn anything else. You'd learn English, mm -hmm. which was funny. But my father spoke a very particular brand of English, and that's what this story is about. So it was Detroit. It was three in the morning. We were in a gas station. I was walking around. I remember looking at the Cheetos. I'm eight. Who doesn't like Cheetos? <laughs> and I heard an altercation near the front, near the front of the till. I heard like some scuffling, et cetera. I don't know what exactly happened, but I came to the front, and my dad was getting jumped by four Mexican guys. Damn. Right? So they're hitting him. Bang, bang. One of them got a ball. Start smashing him. They're beating the shit out of him. Even as my dad was getting his ass kicked, I'm eight. I'm standing there just frozen. As he was getting his ass kicked, he turned to me. And I remember he almost, he growled at me. And he went, run to me as he was getting beaten, right? He managed to get one of them and hold him tight and must have bit in his face. Because whatever he bit, he had flesh in his mouth by the time the whole thing was done, right? So he bit something off. So there's blood everywhere. Anyway, the shopkeeper starts screaming, so he's going to call the police. It kind of starts tussling, goes half outside. My dad managed to stay inside. The, the Mexican guys run off. My dad's covered in blood. His head's cut. He bit that guy's 
I think he bit the guy's lip off. Mm -hmm. So there's blood all down the face of him. He's absolutely covered in blood. He's drenched in blood. And I'm standing by the drinks cabinet, still just standing there. Because he told me to run. So what the fuck are you going to run in a 7-Eleven? So I'm just standing by the drinks cabinet. He said, son, son. So I came over there. And my dad's standing there. He's talking to the shopkeeper. The shopkeeper was Korean. Saying, it wasn't your fault. It wasn't your fault, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, police come. And the police look through the CCTV. They see that my dad fought all these guys off. And the police officer said, so what's your job? What do you do? And he was taking the, the statement. My dad said, I'm a chess player. And the police officer said, chess player? Maybe you should be something else. And my dad replied, my unmatched perspicacity coupled with sheer indefatigability makes me a feared opponent in any realm of human endeavor. <laughs> right in the report. But what my dad was saying, unmatched perspicacity. Perspicacity, perspicacity is the ability to perceive, right? Perception. My unmatched perception. Indefatigability is the, ability, is the inability to become tired. So he's saying I have unmatched perception and I never become tired. And that's why I'm a feared opponent in any realm of human endeavor. Mm. And I remember that quote from when I was eight years old. Wow. That's a badass way to talk. I'm jealous to this God, day. Damn. People think I'm good on my podcast. That's how my dad just spoke through life. He just been rattled to the brain. And that's how he gives a police report. Like powerful, the OG. Man. That's powerful. Uh, okay. Um, there you oh. go. There's a story on that one, man, from, uh, from the late great uh, Six Papa Tate. Um, yeah. You, you want to read that one? Yeah. Andrew? My unmatched perspicacity coupled with sheer indefatigability makes me a feared opponent in any realm of human endeavor. Bam. Fantastic, man. Oh, Rest in peace. I your can't father. even say that word. Tongue tied. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's not easy. Michael D'Angelo, big fan of all you three. Uh, Andrew question. If you had the opportunity to go on Joe Rogan podcast, would you fresh and fit? Would you ever have Rogan on your show? Um, yes. We will one day, man. Uh, yeah. One day. Yes. And then, um, Andrew, I guess that's a yes or no. Would you? Would you yeah. Want? I mean, why not? Yeah, well, sure. Yeah. I like Rogan. Simeon uh, Panides. Uh, 50 bucks, Andrew, you still use the cherry emoji to dazzle the baddies on Insta. Your PhD course was 10 out of 10 PS. Nobody likes us. We don't care. We don't care. Keep with the good work, fellas. Thank you. Wait, okay, hold on. So when you do a check, you put cherries? I put cherries, G. Because, yeah, of course. Who doesn't like cherries? You like cherries? Bro, I put W. Do you like cherries? No. Oh, come on, Fresh. <laughs> I like Why are you lying? I like cherries. Everyone loves Fresh, cherries, Fresh bro. Like Why any... you don't lie? No, but I don't, I don't like, like He doesn't loves... like fruits or he doesn't I like, like any food. fruits or vegetables, man. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sorry. Chicks love cherries. <laughs> but I put like a W, though. Some fries, Fresh? Scoop, scoop. <laughs> there we go. With this, we're going to take Andrew Richardson to dinner and put it on the vlog. There you bro, go. <laughs> bang, 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 let's man. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about how chess inspired your fighting career? Yeah, so when I was a child, I was playing chess all the time with my father. I was a state chess champion of Indiana. I was on my way to become a grandmaster. And then when my uh, mother and father decided to break up, we decided to move back to England because England has a social housing, social housing program, right? In America, you're broke, you're broke. But in England, you can get a house, you get a bit of food, that kind of stuff. It's actually kind of crazy not to get political, but Americans, especially the conservatives, are constantly harping on about, we don't want this to become a socialist country. And they call Europe socialist countries, but the tax rate in England is about the same as here. And wow. there you get free health care, a free house if you're broke. That What do they give you in America? Nothing. They're too busy bombing countries. <laughs> Stupid. <laughs> Stupid. So, um, yeah, so we moved back over there. My and dad, Andrew is American for you guys that are I'm wondering. American. Yeah, he's I'm American, American and yeah. he's British, guys. Yeah, both. so I'm half half. So uh, my dad stayed here in America, so I lost my chess coach. And uh, it's hard to stay dedicated and stay good without a coach, right? So right. for a long time, I played a bit of chess. I did a little bit back and forth, et cetera. And when I realized I needed probably 13, 14, I was missing all that time I spent playing chess. I was looking for something that was similar, and I ended up choosing fighting. I started with karate. I got a black belt in Shotokan, and I moved on to kickboxing. And I fought K1, and I've had MMA fights as well. So mm -hmm. to me, they're very, very similar. They're one-on-one. -on -one. There's no luck involved. Uh, I don't really like, I didn't want a team sport because in a team sport, you can have a bad day, still win a good day, still lose. No, I want it all on the line. Right. Mm -hmm. I didn't want a sport with any luck. That's the thing about chess. It doesn't matter how well you played. It doesn't matter how nearly perfect the game was. If you lost at some point, you made a mistake. Even if you can't identify it at some point, you have made a mistake. And that's a fantastic metaphor for life as well. Cause there's so many people out here who don't take responsibility and they'll come along and go, well, COVID happened. That's why I lost all my money. No. I don't buy that. I don't give a shit what happened. At some point, you did not diversify. You did not prepare yourself. You made a mistake. It's a good life philosophy I have. Everything that's good that happens to me is all my fault. And everything bad that happens to me is all my fault. I take absolute responsibility. Mm -hmm. So chess teaches you that, right? And fighting's the same. People talk about lucky punch. If you're fighting a dude who trained to punch people in the face and then he punches you in the face, it wasn't a lucky punch. <laughs> That's what he does, right? right? So there's no luck involved. All the glory's with you. And it's also a very cerebral sport. Fighting's not, I mean, you need to be a tough guy. 
But tough guys have short careers. Smart guys have long careers. Mm -hmm. Look at Mayweather's career. He didn't get hit. Yeah. That's, that's why he could fight so long. Great he didn't example. get hit. Everyone else had to retire early because your brain gets frazzled. You can't think as fast. You start getting caught. So it's certainly a cerebral sport. And it replaced chess for me. And I took it very, very seriously. And, and I did very, very well. So, uh, wow. yeah, to me, they're the exact same thing. They're the exact same thing. But if I had to decide which one is actually harder, I'd still say chess. Okay. Man, that man, that game's. And you lived in the UK for most of your adult life. Uh, yeah. And you were fighting in, in the UK. And, you know, you, you, uh, you lived in Luton. Yep, if I'm not mistaken, which has a huge Islamic population, Muslim population, which Massive. Is why, yeah, which is why he's so in tune with you know uh, Islamic culture and the religion, etc. Which we'll talk about that as well later on, guys. Yeah. Don't worry, we got to cover everything here uninterrupted. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, living in the United Kingdom and what led you to leave? Yeah, so I liked England. I I don't want to say too much bad about England, mm. but the whole West, the West as a whole, as they close the net on humanity, which they're doing in real time. I mean, it's been sped up with COVID, but even before that, the net was closing. Yeah. I always had this sense that something wasn't quite right about the way the world functioned, the things I was being told, the ideas I was supposed to believe, the way they want me to act. I always had this, it always angered me a little bit. I can't explain why. It's almost like, I know I, know I always reference the movie, The Matrix, but you know, Neo, they're saying you're looking, but you don't know what you're looking for. You're up all night scanning the internet. You don't know what you're looking for. I was always kind of like that, even when I was 16, 17, 18 years old. All the propaganda from all the, the television, the school, my, my first normal job, all these things they were telling me, something just didn't sit right with me in my soul. And uh, I was looking for a way out, right? The actual reason why I eventually totally left England, I don't know if I've told this story before, it's because some bitch called the police on me. Have I ever told this story? Not on our podcast, please. Yeah, you please do. It on, uh, okay, it's a long story. Well, we need Go some ahead, more man. vodka. Yeah, we need we some more it. vodka. Get some vodka. I'll yeah, tell you a story. Vodka. I'll tell you some story. I'll tell you a story. Yeah, yeah, man. Yo, that's very true, man. Like yeah. chess embodies so many other things in life, guys. Like these women are replaceable. Just get her to the other side of the board, and she'll turn into a queen. But if you get surrounded and die, the game is over. I need you guys to value yourself the same fucking way. Andrew, can you tell us that story? As yeah. I All right. So let me set. Let me, let me set the scene. Yeah. We set the scene. We got the bel Belvedere. I got you the Belvedere, bro. I got you. I got you the nice. I like that. I like that. All right. So we got some Belvedere, and let me set the scene. So I am three-time kickboxing world champion. I hadn't won my fourth world title yet. And I made money with fighting, but it's not boxing, right? So I, I made like 50, 60, 70 grand a fight, but I wasn't making millions and millions of dollars a fight. Yeah. So I always still wanted more money. And this is, I don't know if you guys heard before about how I started my cam company. I don't want to mix too many stories together, but I ended up with Let's a wedding. Let's do it. Should I do it? All right. So, oh, man. <laughs> tell man. how you want to tell it, Andrew. This yeah. is yeah. Andrew's, a Andrew Tate Uncensored. This is your interview, my this friend. Is your story, Ain't nobody brother. gonna stop you. Okay. Go ahead. All right. Okay. So I decided to start a webcam company. The story behind that, I'll give you a very short version of it. The story behind that is I was buying a, a place in Thailand and I was short for my last payment. It was 300 grand. I paid 200. I needed the last 100 grand to pay. I had 70 grand and I was 30 grand short. And I said to Tristan, I'm gonna be a G. I'm gonna go casino and I'm gonna make it. Lee, give me the 70 G's. I'm going to come back with 100. And Tristan said, well, listen, you're my brother. I trust you. If you, if you want to do it, do it. I was like, listen, every once in a while, you have to get lucky in life, right? Mm -hmm. So I went and I hit the casino with my 70 grand. I put my nice suit on, took a bad bitch, had a martini first, shaken, not stirred. <laughs> I did it right. And I got fucked up. I lost all the money. Got wrecked, bro. Lost 70 G's in two hours. Thanks, my friend. Damn. Of course, bro. So now, now I need 100 grand, right? So now I'm really broke. So when I came home, Tristan's like, did you make it? I'm like, no. And he's like, oh, man. I'm like, I know. Oh, man. What, can, what the fuck can you do, right? Yeah. And I, I didn't have a fight coming up for, let's say, two months. So I had no money coming in for two months. I had to make this payment. So I said to Tristan, I'm not going to leave my bedroom until I work out how to make us some money. Mm -hmm. And he said, why? I said, well, I heard about some scientists that did that crazy shit. And they still talk about him now. So maybe he did something right. So <laughs> I'm going to do the same dumb shit. I'm going to sit in my room. So I sat in my room. Next day, I wake up. All right, I need to get rich. And I'm starting from nothing, right? So I get on my laptop and I start Googling, what is money? Where does it come from? How does money work? And then I start learning about fractional reserve banking, the Federal Reserve, how it's not linked to gold anymore. I, I didn't even understand how banks worked. I didn't understand any of this shit. I started looking it all up and I spent a good three or four days studying. And then I got really angry because I realized that money is bullshit. It's all a lie. It's printed from the sky, and I still don't have any. <laughs> so now I'm really pissed off. I'm like, what, this trash? I don't even have any of it. Paper. This paper, I don't even have any, right? So now I'm really, really mad. So I'm sitting there trying to look up how to make money, 
And I got a piece of paper and I was trying to write down ideas. I started writing down all these crazy ideas, blah, blah, blah. And it said, write down your assets, the assets you have. I mean, I had an apartment, but it was rented. I had a car, but it was on finance. I was big and strong, but I was already kickboxing. It was an asset. But one thing I did have is I had all these girlfriends from all around the world. Because when I would go around the world fighting and I'd win a fight, I'd fuck a ring girl. She'd fall in love with the champ. She thinks I'm some big millionaire living in London. Mm -hmm. She's in Paris or Moscow or wherever she is. I can't wait to see you again. I miss you. I miss you. I miss you. So I had all these girlfriends from all around the world. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, maybe I can open a strip club. But to open a strip club takes money. I didn't have any money. So how am I going to buy a club, get licensing, get insurance, all this kind of crap? Yeah. Very expensive. So it's expensive, right? So I wrote down I had all these chicks. I mean, I'm not ruthless enough to put them on the track. I mean, these are my hoes. I mean, I ain't giving them up. Like, these are my bitches. Like, I, gotta, I didn't want to go out there on the streets. So I was like, well, what can I do with them anyway? So by coincidence, and I'll say this now, and I'll state this with absolute integrity. Mm. I never was a porn guy. In fact, to this day, I can, I literally will swear on my father's grave. I cannot, I can honestly say I've never sat down and watched porn on my own ever. Mm. I just fuck. If I want to fuck, I fuck. I, there's no such thing as a dry spell in Tate land. So like, I got something to fuck. <laughs> like, like, don't worry. I'm fine. Right. So I never was a porn guy. So I never really was into it. So I'm on all these strange websites, looking up all these things. And there's something in the corner. One of them links to talk to live girls now or something. Mm. And I was like, talk to live girls now. I don't know why I clicked on it. I don't know if it's because about 10 minutes before I just written down, I had all these girlfriends, but I clicked on it and I saw some chick on a webcam, some girl in Russia sitting there, like it was dial up, like still moving around, like slowly <laughs> with, her, with her titties, dial up titties like this. I saw some dial up titties and I was like, what the fuck she's sitting there for? And then I saw like a tip come in. It's like, oh, so people are paying this bitch. Mm -hmm. But I didn't realize, no, really know how much it could make. So for the next few days, I'm sitting there looking at all these cam companies, yeah. all these cam websites. I'm saying to Tristan, maybe we should start a cam website. Maybe we should start a cam website. And my an idea initially was to start my own website. And then I realized it's better just to put girls on their website. So that was the plan I came up with to make money. So I booked a flight for all my girlfriends. Because this is what I was thinking, right? Yeah. I was thinking, okay. Which of the girls are the hottest? Well, she's the hottest, but she's got a bit of an attitude. This one ain't as hot, but she's sweet as pie. She'll do as I say. Which one do I really want? I don't know. I can't afford to get five premises. I can't put them all in five apartments. I don't have any money. So I'm just going to have to go dark triad militant yoga fire douse him. <laughs> you understand? Yeah. Yoga yeah. flame. I was like, fuck it. Yoga flame. So I told Tristan my plan. <laughs> I'm going to fly them all in. He's like, when? I'm like, at once, bro. I'm doing one airport pickup. I got shit to do. <laughs> I'm going back and forth to the fucking airport all day. So I timed it, got them all on different flights, bang, they all landed within 45 minutes of each other, picked them all up. They all got in the car. They didn't even know who each other were. They're like, who's this girl? Who's that? Hi, Andrew, miss you. Trying to kiss me. I'm like, don't kiss me yet. Doing the other. <laughs> Just driving my car full of hoes, broke. <laughs> driving back to the apartment. Yeah, bro. But, but you know what? I needed money. I needed money. That's the difference between wanting money and needing money. Yeah. I needed money. So I sat all five of them down. I told them the truth. I said, listen, young ladies, I'm starting a webcam business. I've got a big sponsor. I've got millions of dollars of backing. This is going to be huge. This is going to change your life. You're going to be a multimillionaire from this. It's going to take a couple of years of work. And we're going to all going to stay here in this apartment. We're going to live together. We're going to be a family. And you're going to do as I say. And you're going to be rich. And all of them were like, what? Who's this bitch? I'm like, my girlfriend. Well, I thought I was your girlfriend. You're all my girlfriend. I just came at it honestly. Tristan actually made up his famous quote he still uses to this day. Because mm. Tristan said to me, T. I was like, what? He goes, you're still in fight shape. I was like, what do you mean? He goes, they ain't got hands. <laughs> I said, what are they going to do? Right? They can't beat me up. Like, I'm hard to kill. What are they going to do? You're going to come get Aikido, bitch? You're going to do nothing but cry. Shut up. So I sat all five from there, told him the truth. Three got crazy. Said, I'm leaving. I'm, I'm, I'm. I said, fucking go then. Two stayed, and that was the beginning of my webcam empire. So I had two girls and me sleep in one bed, threesome every night, little happy family, 12 hours a day of broadcasting online. And the way it started was what I learned then when I started my webcam business is that women are one, lazy, and two, they really have no intuition. Even if you're a smart female, even if you have a degree and you're considered smart, you have no like intuition on life. Right. So I had these two girls and I set them up, bought the laptops, put them on cam, etc. And they weren't making that much money. And I was analyzing their chats afterwards and I could see why. Just saying dumb shit. <laughs> dumb shit, bro. Like if, if they were sitting there talking to an old guy and the old guy would say, what kind of guys do you like? 
she'd say, I like young guys with good body and money to some old fat dude. Wow. Why? But that's in the game. Why can't you say, no, you need to say, I'm tired of these young guys messing me around. I want a guy who's been through that phase in his life, looking for something more stable. You know, and if you get a young guy, you need to say, I'm tired of these old perverts hitting on me. Finally, I'm talking to a hot guy. So you need to play into the fantasy. So I'm trying to teach these bitches. So it gets to the point where after the work shift, we're sitting around at dinner and I'm like, look, here's how you sell this. The like, proper businessman. Here's how you do this. Here's how you do this. Listen, ho, you said this wrong. <laughs> I have transcripts. I have transcripts of her of their webcam chats. Damn. No, no. Highlight. No, no. Do this. Change this. Try to teach them. Right. Yeah. And then I realized, you know what's easier than teaching these bitches? I'm just going to do it myself. Mm. So I had I had about four months to my next fight. And I thought, it takes me three months to get in shape. I got one month off. And for that month, I sat the girl on camera, gave her a keyboard that wasn't plugged in. And she'd just go like this. And I sat behind the screen. And mm. I finessed the dudes. Me, myself. <laughs> I was a cam girl. Bro, <laughs> bro, I cam girl and said all the right things. And with these two bitches, I made 110 grand in my first month. Damn. And two I, girls that decided to stay with you. Two girls that stayed with me. I, I, I rinsed it. Because these guys were talk, talking about World War II and shit. All the uh, fucking, bro. I knew all of it, bro. Yeah. They were like, I can't believe you know. She, and I was like, yeah, well, I'm from Russia. We're taught in school. The dude thought she was some World War II historian. <laughs> this bitch didn't know nothing. She's a bimbo. <laughs> she could barely suck a dick. It was crazy. So I was rinsing the game. And from there, I thought, you know what? This is how much I'm making with two girls. Imagine I had more girls. Right. And that was the beginning of my empire. So I ended up getting to the point where I had 75 girls in five different premises working. For me. But I had it tiered, right? I had a management structure. So by then, girl could join. She could work hard, work for like a year and a half, and then become a manager. So now she doesn't have to actually sit on the cam anymore. She has to manage and train the new girls. This is where I learned something else about females. Women don't like listening to women. <laughs> women will listen to the boss, the G. Yeah. If I come in and say, look, do this, do this, do this, cool. But if they do this, do this, do this, she's like, well, who the fuck are you? Who the fuck are you? Yeah, why don't you go on cam? She's like, well, I've been on cam. Well, you're not on cam now. They're just oh, yeah. cat fights, All right? Time. And, and when I tell this story, everyone thinks I was living like Dan Bilzerian. I was not interested in fucking these girls. I wanted to be rich. That's the reason I was successful. I was successful because I could withhold my thirst completely. Most men can't. Most men cannot be in a premises with 75 naked hoes, and I didn't give a fuck. I didn't want to even look at titties. I wanted money. It's all I cared about, right? So when I had these 75 girls, I had a whole bunch of problems because I learned a bunch of lessons about women. Another lesson I learned is that women will cut off their nose to spite their face. They don't give a fuck. They'll ruin their own life to try and annoy you. I had girls I was paying thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 a month, and over some stupid argument, they want to quit. I was like, you're going to lose 40 grand a month. I, I'd rather lose that than work for you. It's like, what? Because I told you to make your bed? Wow. You're like, you're an idiot. And they would, and they'd leave. And they, they'd always text you later and try and get their job back. But then you can't show weakness in front of the other chicks. If you let a chick come back who quit, then everyone may as well quit and come back. It's a wrap. You, yeah. It's a wrap. You can't. You have to be solid with it, right? Another thing I learned is that women are only loyal to the dick they're sucking. Because no, nice. they are. If any girl I was sleeping with worked her ass off and was cool. Any girl who was a pure business arrangement and she had her own boyfriend on the side, they'd last maybe three weeks till their boyfriend would say, why are you working for this man? We can do this ourselves. Why don't you come do it with me? And she'd leave with that guy and they'd make no money because just like a podcast, how many people say to you, oh, I can start a podcast. Easy. All the tech, all the bullshit behind it. Of course. The hard work. Every girl that comes the, in here, yeah. I want to do a podcast. Yeah, of course you do. It looks so much fun. Yeah, yeah. I can do it. That's no, you funny. can't. There's a whole bunch that goes on. There's so much intangible, right? And this is what people don't understand. Why would a girl work for you, Andrew? Because there's incalculable intangible involved, right? So girls were fucking crazy. Anyway, to cut this story a little shorter. You don't have to. Continue on. Okay. So I had my 75 hoes. We ain't cutting Andrew off, man. <laughs> Keep going. Let them know. I had my 75 hoes. But the ones I'm sleeping with, I'm keeping somewhere around. Let me just do the math. One second. 100% of the fucking money. <laughs> I'm planning for our financial future. Right. It's important we're rich forever, bitch. That's why I just bought myself that Ferrari. <laughs> so I'm keeping all the fucking money, right? Yeah. But the girl... <laughs> you think I wasn't saying those lines, my friend? Why'd you buy the Ferrari? Because we're rich forever now. You don't trust me? I don't trust you. Shut up, then. That's why I got the fucking leather seat. Sell the dream, man. Sell yeah, the dream. Sell, so, <laughs> that's right. So, I'm keeping all the money of the girls I'm fucking. Yeah. So, now, I have, uh, I have a financial incentive to fuck as many as I can, right? And this is why I go back to the game about me not being thirsty. Bro, I'm telling you now, and I'm saying this without arrogance, without trying to make a funny story. There were days I woke up 
look through the figures because I always fuck the girls who did the best to motivate them and think, I got to fuck 11 girls today. I just don't want to. Oh. I was depressed. I was like, 11, 11 bitches. <laughs> it's like, you got to put a performance in, right? I was like, oh, I just want to play chess. <laughs> Why don't these horny bitches leave me alone? <laughs> like, I didn't want to do any of it, right? Yeah. And that's also where I learned a lot. People say to me all the time, you're these, these game tips, these things you learned. Da, da, da. I spent my time around beautiful women I didn't want to sleep with, who wanted to sleep with me. It taught me a whole bunch about female psychology. Because you'd be amazed when a bitch really loves you how horny these fuckers are. Yeah. She wouldn't leave me the fuck alone. And any girl who I wasn't sleeping with, I'd try to motivate them with money, give them a higher percentage. So anyway, the way it worked out, I had all these girls. A lot of them were on a higher percentage. The ones I was sleeping with, I kept all of it. In my best ever month, after I paid all the expenses, after I paid all the management, all the staff, all the uh, premises, da, 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 my best ever month, I made $454,000. Wow. Net, net. That was for me. Fucking Boom. After awesome. everything. Jeez. So I, I, thought I, I thought I'd cracked it, right? And this is also kind of why I retired from fighting. Because after that month, I got the call, world title fight. And now I'm like, ah, oh, I can't be in the office. Mm. Uh, I have to leave it to the girls. Oh, now I took that. Good. I took that fight and I won. But as soon as I started training again, the month after, I made like 180. That was the difference in oh, price. Shit. Mm. So I lost much more than I even got paid to fight. You know, wow. because I left it in the hands of all the management and the women. And women are women. Women are instinctively lazy. Women do not understand. If you if you give a girl, if you teach a girl, if you teach a girl how to make a thousand dollars. In an hour, yeah. she'll think I only have to work three hours this week. There you go. Where um, if you teach a man how to make a thousand dollars an hour, he'll think I can make twenty four thousand dollars a day, mm -hmm. right? So women were lazy. So I had these seventy five girls. I decided because I wanted to keep fighting to instead of having an army, I'm going to reduce it to special forces. <laughs> I walked in in a robe, Versace robe, drunk to Tristan's room and said, "Listen, T, this is reenact." <laughs> I was like, "Bruv," he goes, "What?" I said, well, we got this army of hoes. We could just get some special forces. He said, what do you mean? I was like, let's take our 20 best girls, the 10 you're fucking, the 10 I'm fucking. Let's get rid of all the drama, all the headache from all the stupid girls we ain't fucking. All the times our boyfriend comes to the door trying to act fresh, you have to fuck them up or I have to fuck them up. All this crap that's going on. Let's just get 10 girls, 10 girls. Let's settle down. I'll settle down with my 10 bitches. You settle down with your 10 bitches. Let's be good men of God. Let's, let's relax. <laughs> let's relax a little bit. And we agreed. So that's what we agreed to do. So we took the 10 best of his, 10 best of mine. Me and my brother share everything except hoes. His hoes, my hoes. So we take them all to this one big house. So I got 10 girlfriends. He's got 10 girlfriends. Me and him, boom. We're sitting there. We're working. We're making, because they were our best girls. We were still making 250, 300 a month. None of the bullshit. None of the extra premises. None of the crap. Da, da, da. So everything was good for about two months. And here's where it all went fucking wrong. And this is why I left England. So you get a bit of vodka because this is a no. Uh, go ahead, go ahead. So this is why you left England. This is how it all went wrong. So I'm the big G now, right? I was broke. I was a broke fighter. Nine months later, Ferrari, Lambo, penthouse. You made your first million. Yeah. Oh, I made a bunch of money. Right. I'm killing it now. I'm the big G. I walk around in my robe. I, <laughs> I call myself a robe trillionaire. Like, I don't have to put on clothes for nobody. You can come to my house to talk business. I'm wearing a robe and my underwear. What the fuck do you want? I'm that guy. Right. So I'm living in this house, right? One night, there was this stupid bitch. You know what? Maybe she's watching this. The case is over now. Stupid bitch. Serena. That's her <laughs> dumb ass name. Oh, this is the first fresh uh -oh. fit exclusive. Stupid bitch. So I'm fucking her. <laughs> hey, you know, hey, the big hey, G, it's part of the game. So I'm yeah. fucking her. Da -da. Anyway, she gets really jealous of this other bitch. They're fighting. She stole my lipstick, blah, blah, blah. And, and what I was really doing is when you're a pimp, you're a massive, you're a HR department. You have to settle the disputes. You got to keep everyone happy. Right. Because that's what it all is. G happy girls make money. Facts. You can't sit on the webcam miserable. These guys are trying to escape their miserable wives. You got to be happy. You're an actress. Right. You got to be positive. And that's what a pimp is, a positively inspirational and motivating person. <laughs> that's my job, right? That's a good breakdown. <laughs> I was a positively inspirational and motivating person. That's what I was. <laughs> I could take a fine Caucasian of the wrong persuasion and tell him, that if men think you're handsome, they need to pay your ransom. <laughs> <laughs> and we'd make some money. Yo. And, and that was the game, right? So I had to keep them all happy. So you're a big HR department, as well as a big part of it is huge emotional support. People always ask, why would a girl work for you? Because when you work for me, it was problemless. You sit on the computer, you do your hours, you get money. You ain't gonna worry about taxes. You ain't gonna worry about tech. 
You can worry about that stalker trying to find you. You ain't got to worry about what theme to have in your show that day. You ain't got to worry about thinking. You ain't going to do nothing but sit there, smile, and press a keyboard that ain't plugged in. That's it. <laughs> That's why you work for me and you don't try and do it your fucking self. And the ones who tried to do it themselves didn't make any money because they're too lazy. So I used to have a bunch of alcohol in the house. Girls used to drink whenever they wanted, before they went online, whatever, whatever. Serena and this other bitch had an argument. Serena starts walking around the house drinking, shouting ratchet shit. You think you're this, you this bitch. Da, da, da. I'm Serena. Shut up. But I like Serena because Serena made me the most money. Right. But Serena also knew she made me the most money. Oh. So it was one of them. You know what I mean? But I'm like, Serena, listen, leave it, leave it, leave it. Shut up, shut up, shut up. Ah, bah, 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 being a dickhead. She goes to work. She drinks, she drinks, she drinks. She drinks so much she throws up. Ho, hoes, right? And I was like, Serena, you better fucking clean that up. She goes, we have a cleaner. I said, the cleaner's here at 9 a.m. tomorrow morning. I ain't letting six sit on my fucking floor for five hours because it's 4 a.m. by now. Yeah. Clean it the fuck up. That bitch did it, did it, did Being an idiot, right? So it gets to the point where Serena's now arguing with me. And this is the, this is the thing, man. One bad apple. Mm. It'll spoil it, Facts. right? Yeah. And, and, and I want to make this very clear. In my pimp career, I never had to, to hit a girl. I never had to, like, threaten them. It wasn't about that. Girls felt good to be around me. It was a very positive atmosphere. Mm -hmm. But this bitch is now testing me. And if I accept her disrespect just because she makes so much more money, then I'm going to have a problem with all the other girls. Yes. Right. So I said, Serena, I'm telling you to clean that up. We're going to leave here, and you're never going to come back. I ain't fucking going nowhere. Blah, 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 all this shit. Kept running her mouth, threw a drink at me. Stupid hoe. Ooh. Ooh. So I got all her shit. It's hard to explain how the penthouse worked, but it was three floors. And on the third floor was like a roof. Got all her shit up to the roof, <laughs> threw it all off, went downstairs, got her in her underwear, picked her up by her arms, and marched her ass, ass oh, out, out the door, much like you do with these girls. <laughs> out <laughs> the door. Throw it all on the floor. <laughs> Fuck you. Done. She's in her underwear. Gave her the Leonidas. Shit's out in the street. Bang, 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 bang. Another thing I used to do when I had my 75 girls is one of the psychological tricks I would play because females, they collapse to peer pressure, and females are absolutely and utterly sensitive to how they're viewed by groups of others. They, they need to fit in. Yeah. So whenever a girl would leave, when I had 75 girls working for me, we'd have a fuck that bitch party. <laughs> fuck that bitch, that, fuck that bitch. bitch. Fuck that bitch, right? <laughs> so if a girl was hung, I'd play the song. <laughs> so when a girl would leave, all the other girls used to party and make fun of her for leaving. She ain't going to make any money without you, Andrew. You helped her so much. She didn't have shoes when she came here. She's ungrateful. <laughs> She's a stupid bitch. I'm like, you're right, baby. She's a stupid bitch. And everyone used to get around and talk shit about this bitch. And what happened is then no one wanted to leave because they knew if they left, there'd be a party about <laughs> Right? But so we cut down to the special forces. This is the first bitch who left. Oh. So the second, even though she's outside the door banging, after about kids, she starts hearing, Fuck that bitch. Boom. She starts saying the <laughs> fuck that bitch party start. So now she's really mad, right? Started laughing. We turned the, the computers off. We started drinking. Yeah. Fuck that bitch. I mean, I was pissed off. I lost like 70, 80 grand a month. She was big money, but whatever, right? Drinking. She starts texting me. You owe me money. You owe me this. You ruined my stuff when you threw it off the roof. I want this. I want that. Blah, blah, threatening me. Phone blowing texts. up, huh? Yeah, blowing up. Text I replied to her just saying, listen, bitch, you're crazy. You're not getting a fucking thing. I'm not even paying you your last month's wages. You threw up all over my floor. No. <laughs> So anyway, arguing back and forth with her for about two months, didn't think nothing of it. Oh, shit. Five o'clock in the morning, one day, I'm laying in bed with my hose, chilling. And if anyone, any of the real Gs out here know, sleeping with one chick is kind of comfortable and cool. Sleeping with four is awful. <laughs> it's fucking horrible. It's hot. You're in the middle. It's hot as fuck. You can't get up or move the covers without uncovering one of them. You can't go piss without fucking climbing a mountain. All their legs are fucking moving and shit. <laughs> I bought the biggest bed you could fucking buy, and I hated it. So I'm only, I, I swear I was half asleep my, for the whole pimp career. Because I didn't get a good night's sleep ever. So I'm kind of half asleep. <sighs> boom, 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 boom. And I just knew it was police. But I didn't know why they would be there. Yeah. But like, police, police. And the girl's like, oh my God, oh my God. I'm like, all right, chill, relax, relax. So um, I got up and said, hello. They go, police, open the door, we're going to open the door, we're going to break the door. I was like, okay. And I, I didn't do anything wrong, so I didn't understand what the problem was. I opened the door. They sent the, the big man squad for me. Mm -hmm. Full SWAT, tasers drawn, body armor, helmets. Everything. Did they have guns too? This is England, so. No, they were armed. They had they armed. Were armed. Yeah. To the, to Guys, that's a big squad. deal in England because the police don't carry guns there. And the police officer had a picture of me on a clipboard with my <laughs> world title belt. Damn. So they knew I could fight, so they sent the, the, the serious extraction of course, squad. Of course. And I was like, whoa, what the fuck? Don't come in here. And there's five of them. And he said, listen, I don't know what they want you for. It's just my job to bring you in. Even if you're innocent, you can explain to the detective. 
wow. but I have to take you so you can resist or you can comply. Mm. That's what he said to me. And I was like, fair enough. <laughs> well, there's no point in me arguing my case to this guy because yeah. there's nothing to do with him. Yeah. He's just right. to bring me, right? I said, okay, but what am I being arrested for? So you're being arrested for assault. I was like, assault? Against who? You're being arrested for the assaulting of Serena Ho-Face. <laughs> I was like, Serena Ho-Face? Ho-Face? I didn't touch that bitch. Yo, I and he's like, he's like, and, and he, he was cool. He goes, yeah. you probably didn't, bro. You're probably innocent, but I have to take you in. So he was kind of cool about it. Right. So I was like, all right, fuck it. So I thought this is going to take 10 minutes, right? Because I'm innocent. 10 minutes. Went upstairs, got dressed. The girls were all crying. I'm like, don't worry, Serena Ho-Face, minor. Don't worry about it. Boom. <laughs> Put my clothes on, got in the police car, went down to the police station. They put my ass in a cell. I'm sitting in the cell. A little side story. When I walk in, the guy who checks us all in is fat as fuck, right? A little fat, a real fat guy. And, I'm, and he asked me some question. Oh, uh, okay, Andrew Tate, yeah, is that your name? Yeah, you just said my name. Yeah, that's my name. Like, this guy's an idiot. So I got in a little tiff with him back and forth. Anyway, he annoyed me. And he said, I just wanted to let you know that uh, you're going to be monitored in the cell. Uh, we have some pre-tell info on you, so you're going to be monitored in your cell. So if you have any ideas... I'm going to see him. What, what idea am I going to have to sell you, dickhead? What am I going to do? So because he was a fat fuck, my idea in my cell was to do endless press-ups. Teach him a lesson. <laughs> so they put me in my cell. And just they put me up. in my cell. I'm like the master of Udon. Like, douse him. I'm sitting there. And I'm just sitting with my eyes closed. Generating power from the universe. Sitting there. Timing five minutes in my head. Counting 60 seconds. Five minutes. Busting out 100 push-ups. Sitting back down, five minutes timing one, two, just not not even hundred push-ups, and I was doing it knowing that this fat fuck is watching me, <laughs> going, "Who the fuck is this dude? He's a monk for five minute intervals and doing push-ups. This is weird." Now I don't know if, if it was me doing that and they were trying to test my endurance or if they're just inefficient. But I was in that cell for like six hours before my interview. I was in there for a long fucking time, wow. and after a couple hours, I couldn't really do the push-ups anymore. So I had to, you know, I had to go from 100 to like 90, to like 80. But still, every five minutes, I did something. I didn't quit because I ached for like two weeks afterwards. So I'm telling you, bro. <laughs> I was sitting there for my five minutes, breathing in and out, trying to get power back in the muscles. All to annoy this fat prick. It's like, yeah, you're fat. You're out of shape. Let me show you something. Pussy. They take me from the cell. They put me in front of the two investigating officers. Dyke one and dyke two. <laughs> two fat bitches. And that's when I knew I was in trouble. Because like, oh, they got females investigating this shit now. Yeah. <laughs> oh, now I get it. You got females investigating. Yeah. So I sit down. I'm like, yeah, that bitch is lying. The fuck? Well, Mr. Tate, we've done a psychological profile. We've worked out that you're not a pussy and you say things online that, you know, are true. So we actually have the suspicion that you beat the shit out of her. I was like, I'm a kickboxing world champion. She got a fucking mark on her. She ain't got a mark. How did I hit her if she hasn't got a mark on her? Well, she came to us retrospectively and da da da. I said, why didn't she come to you at the time? Mm. Well, some people come to the police 10 years after an event because it takes bravery to come forward. It's oh, the yeah. fucking dyke shit, bro. <laughs> I'm sitting there just like, you're an idiot. So this bitch goes to me on the 3rd of July at 4.44 a.m. <laughs> can you recite to me and tell me the story of blah, blah, blah. And I sat there and said, listen, if this is going to be used against me in a court of law, I think it's only fair, because we're all human, right? You're a police officer, I'm defendant, blah, blah. But we're all human. Let's all hold each other to human standards. If you can tell me what you were doing on a random morning, three and a half months ago, in detail which you are happy to be used against you in a court of law, <laughs> then I'm happy to answer your fucking question. But if you don't know the shit you were doing a few months ago and you don't remember every detail, why are you expecting it of me? The bitch is lying, I didn't hear her, right? Then the fat bitch made the biggest mistake of her fucking life. Because I said, I need a drink. And she goes, yeah, I want to actually let you know that you're allowed. We're not allowed to refuse you refreshment. You're allowed a drink. I was like, okay. Then I worked out that I can ask for a drink anytime I want. So every time she tried to ask me, can I have a coffee? And every time she had to ask me a question, halfway through, she had to waddle her ass out, out <laughs> the wah, interview wah, room, wah, wah, come wah, back with wah, a coffee. Wah. And I just down it. Boom. Sit down, listen to the rest of her stupid question. Bro, I must have had like 55 coffees. <laughs> it's all on video. You go give me my coffee, right? So what happened was me being a smart ass, I ended up being personally disliked by these two dykes. Goes on for a few hours. They finally let me go. They let me go on bail. But I'm innocent, right? So I go home and I'm a clever motherfucker. I go home and I say, listen, 
Tracy, who's my housewife, who's an old white lady. Mm. You're an old white lady. You look nice and trustworthy in court. You're going to go and tell the police that she was my girlfriend. We never argued. Everything was fine. And you came into a bunch of sick on the floor. All you other nine girls who are here are going to go and tell the story of exactly what happened. You're going to go tell the truth. And we're going to bury this shit, carry on with our lives. The girls all went to the police station. All told the truth. Girl was lying. She was being crazy. Andrew literally nicely walked her out. Never hit her. She's lying. I had 10 witnesses on my side. Mm. Should be over, right? Shouldn't take long. Till I get called in for bail again. What? Get called in. We need you to come back to the police station, Mr. Tate. Blah, blah, blah. All right, safe. Go back to the police station. Get put, put in a cell again. Another six hours. Same fat fuck. Same dousing maneuvers. More push-ups. Same game. When I'm in the cell, they raided my apartment. Took all my phones, all my laptops, all my electronics. Took everything. Raided it like I was a criminal. Right? They let me out six hours later without even interviewing me. Sent me home, and my house had been ransacked. Mm. Everything had been missing. It's like, what the fuck did they take all that shit for? It's only webcam girls. I don't, I don't know what it's about. So they took all that stuff. So now my business is destroyed because I don't have any of the technology anymore. Yeah. So I said to the girls, look. Were the girls there too or no? The girls weren't there at the time, okay, luckily. And you got back. But I said to the girls, look, we're going to take some time off work because they've taken all the shit. I'm sure we'll get it back in a few days. I mean, how long could it take to analyze the computer and see if there's nothing on it, right? Yeah. Took all my shit. What happened next was that the, the two Dyke police officers realized they had no case about the girl lying. But because they hated me, they forensically analyzed all of my phones and computers and raised 12 new charges against me. Damn. From things as simple as making a video while driving to having a yard sale without paying fucking tax to being part of a WhatsApp group, which sent around videos from a war zone. So some dude stepped on a landmine. You know, you're in these stupid WhatsApp groups and videos get sent around. I didn't even share it. Didn't even save it. Yeah. Possession of extremist material. All this craziness. And they hit me with this 12 case, 10 year sentence bullshit. Mm -hmm. out of fucking nowhere damn and i had to fight that i fought that back and forth for three years damn until i was finally free all because one bitch lied and they knew she lied and they dropped the case because she was a liar but they didn't like me so they went through my life and tried to find a reason to put me in jail and that's the reason i said fuck the west fuck england I'm bouncing. That's the I think you've ever told that story in full detail like that. And you, never, you never said her name. Yeah. <laughs> Serena <laughs> Wholeface. <laughs> Hashtag fuck Serena Wholeface. Fuck yeah, Serena man. Wholeface. Hey, hey Serena. Uh, Serena. I never went to jail, bitch. I'm still free and I'm still rich. You're probably <laughs> ugly as fuck now. I kept you for the money. You weren't all that, but you made me enough. You put the leather in the Ferrari, bitch. And now you're sitting there broke as a joke. I'm still free. I'm a free man on fuck you, ho face. So you go over to, so you moved to Romania. Yeah, so I decided to kind of be nomadic. So I've lost faith in the British justice system. And you know what? It's crazy. I actually said to the police officers, because I, I had- Case a, got dismissed, right? Yeah, I had, I, had, I, I had a few interviews back and forth before I got dismissed. And a lot of them were with women. But one of the times I was sitting there with a man, Mark, so I won't say his last name. And I was sitting there with him and I was like, my friend, please understand. I know you think you're doing the right thing, right? The Nazis thought they were doing the right thing. You have to understand that you're a man just like me and any woman you've ever associated with in your life can make up a lie and destroy your life and destroy your career the way that she's trying to destroy mine. I know you think you're doing the right thing by persecuting me, but I've had witnesses come here and show I've done nothing wrong. Now you're digging through my life forensically, trying to find crimes. There's very few people on the street you can drag off the street and forensically analyze and not find some crime of some sort. It's nearly impossible to live a completely law-abiding, strictly by-the-book life, right? You can make a phone call while driving. You do anything, right? That's really a, that's like illegal in England. Yeah, yeah, you can't make a phone call driving. Yeah, yeah that's like 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 a, like a crime. Not no, like well, a, no, a they'll ticket. take your license, that kind of stuff. But what I'm saying oh, is, yeah. they they took a whole bunch of things they found evidence for and they piled it all yeah. up together. Wow, right? So some of them were more serious than others. I'm not going to say on the on the stream. Right. Some of them were some of them were low level stuff. But the point is, I'm saying you're just forensically analyzing my life. You have already pre decided I need to go to jail. Like none of these, none of these bad things I did mattered to you until this bitch came in here and lied to you. Now you've decided that you don't have evidence because of the bitch was lying that I need to go to jail. I have proof the girl is lying. Why don't you persecute her for lying to the police? Mm. Like, why are you coming after me? They, they could be doing the same thing to you, my friend. It never happens then. But yeah, yeah, absolutely crazy. So I lost all faith in the British justice system and I didn't know where, really where to move. So I thought I'd be kind of nomadic because I still had a few of my girls. By now, because of all the problems of legal police, that uh, the nine girls had quit. I'm down to like three or four. And I thought, I'm just going to live around the world. I'll rock up somewhere, get a hotel, three months, boom, boom, make some money, bang, 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 bang. And I'll just run around the world and I'll be above the jurisdiction of any one place. If anything gets hot, I bail. So I went to Romania because I had some really good friends there from kickboxing. 
and uh, thought I'd stay for two months. And here I am six years later. So that's wow. kind of how life works. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a cool place. I really like it. I have nothing bad to say about Romania. So I rocked up there for that reason. Never thought I'd stay there, but I ended up staying there. And that's what it is. And what are the biggest uh, pluses for you? I mean, that you want to disclose uh, as far as like living in Romania versus living in a Western country like the United Kingdom. Yeah. So I, because of what happened to me, I want to make something very, very clear. Right. I don't beat bitches up. Hmm. I, I've never needed to. I don't I, I don't do it. Right. I don't hit girls. I don't walk around like fucking Mike Tyson punching girls ever. But because of what happened to me when I was in Romania, I was paranoid right. and I spoke to a lawyer like. If this happened to me here, what would it happen? Because I was really, I was scared it'd be worse. Yeah. Because you know you're in a foreign country sometimes if someone goes to police and you get locked, you don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. yeah. And he's like, oh, well, the law in Romania is she must have physical evidence of abuse. Did she have physical evidence of abuse? I was like, no, there wasn't a mark on her. I'm like, okay, there's no case. Wow. And I was like, all right, well, safe. <laughs> the good. Like, they're like, yeah, if she gets hit, she needs to either take pictures and she needs to report it within 14 days. Otherwise, it didn't happen. There's none of that ancestral bullshit. Two months, twenty years ago, he touched me. That and all that crap. Yeah. Zero of it. Zero, zero, zero. So I felt comfortable there for a summer, and then coupled with the fact they had stupid things, man, they had the fastest broadband in Europe. They had the fastest internet in Europe. So I had nice oh, really? internet. Yeah, that's a strange fact. I know. I had nice internet streams. I had cheap property uh, for the accommodation for the girls. Yeah. Um, I had really good friends there, and my friends there were super well connected. Like it's the first time I'd had like police escort to the club and shit. So it was cool. It was a cool place. And I thought I'd stay a while and ended up staying for a long time. And I ended up b building my own empire there. Now I have casinos on the ground. I have a property portfolio at the strip mall. I've got it all there. So it's kind of gone well. Yeah. yeah. So that's, that's, that's how it started. I left, I left England out of necessity. I went to Romania out of convenience because I had a friend there who said, yeah, I'll pick up at the airport. I'll look after you and your people. I've got a big house. Come here. And bam, that's, that's how it all Andrew, you're well-traveled. You've been around the world, different girls, di different cities, different yeah. states, different countries. In your humble opinion, yeah. right? What would you say is the current state of dating for the average guy? Is Man. it worth it? Ooh, this is gonna be good, guys. Yeah. Get your notepads out. We gonna break this guys. one down. Yeah, I, I think for the, I'll be honest. I don't want to be a pessimist, but let's put it this way: the game is Take getting it away. harder. The game is getting harder. And if you're sitting out here and you are not trying to level up along with the game, you are gonna struggle into eternity. Mm -hmm. These women have so many choices. They have so many choices, and Social media has made that worse. COVID even has made that worse. These bitches are sitting at home on their phones all day. They read every DM sent to them. Facts. So if you DM a bitch and she doesn't reply, don't worry. She saw it. <laughs> she saw it, my friend. Yeah. She yeah. looked at your profile and you were not interesting enough to get a reply. Facts. 100%. That's what it is. So if you actually understand that, understand all the DMs you send that aren't getting replied to, then you could probably get a pretty good gauge of where you are in the world, right? Now, no one has a 100% success rate. But if I sit there for half an hour and message enough bitches, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find a girl, right? Or two or five, right? But if you're sitting there and you're just sending DMs for months <laughs> and no one's replying to you, <laughs> then you've got a problem. It's getting more and more competitive. And what's actually interesting is I believe that this whole feminism, all this crap was actually initially promoted by beta males. I don't know at what point in history, but my theory which I have a lot of, but my theories tend to be correct. My theory is that during the periods of strong conservatism, it was the alpha males who were like, no, women aren't hoes. Women stick with one man. We're going to have marriage. We're going to have kids. We're going to stick with these things. Mm -hmm. And it was the betas who were like, let women be free. Let them be liberated. <laughs> and the reason they were doing that is they were hoping for a sniff of pussy. That's what beta males were thinking. Well, if we let them be big enough hoes, maybe, maybe, I'll get some free love. Yeah, free love. that's what they were hoping for. Yeah. yeah. And but what they've really done by promoting all this shit. Now the women just fucking caught carousel the alphas. <laughs> True or false? We win. True or false? That's I all they do. I say on the pod all the time, Andrew. Yeah. What feminism has done is it's inadvertently given all the leverage to the top five to ten percent of men. That's what feminism has really done. Because 100%. when you give women the, the, you know, when you leave a woman to her own devices. Yeah. It is literally programmed into her DNA from a millennia of programming to pick the best, the brightest, the tallest, and the strongest, yep. and they will pick them and not pick the regular guys. Yep. Marriage used to be an institution set up to allow average guys a chance at procreation and raising a family in a stable yep. environment. But when you give women the opportunity right, and the ability to mate select on their own, they're always going to pick the best and the brightest, and they're going to ostracize a majority of the men. Hell, think about it. We've had, and me and you have talked about this in, in length. Only 40% of men have procreated since the beginning of time. And yep. that was with institutions put in place yep. to allow these men to procreate like marriage, et cetera. Can you imagine what's going to happen now with the way 
feminism is going and the way that you we basically have a deregulated sexual marketplace, yep. the women are going to small a, a fuck a smaller and smaller and smaller percentage of men, which a lot of you guys are on the brunt of that right now with the way social media is, online dating, etc. Just to add to your point as well, even just a simple DM, right? The fact that girls respond to you is a huge factor because think about this. Back then, you didn't have social media. It was yep. in person talking to girls. That's how you met girls. Yep. Now it is, bro. You could be at home, anywhere in the world. Yep. Kind of Miami. Yep. Kind of Romania. Yep. So girls that used to be there for you, your neighbor. Going like, oh, yeah. Neighbors. This is another thing. You, Go ahead, you nailed it fresh. Yeah. The, the dating market's gone international. So you, you nailed it. You, you used to live in a city full of hot girls, right? And I, oh, Tate lives far away. I'm safe. <laughs> Tate's far away. <laughs> Maybe I'll get some pussy. No, sir. Oh. No, sir. Nope. I'm gonna find her. Put her ass on a private jet. Jizz all over her face. You can have her afterwards. <laughs> there ain't there. You, there's no safety now, right? Nope. It's all become international, and women are now internationally competing. Beautiful women are talking to men in 15 different countries. I, I get this all the time. People say, "Do girls love money?" And I say, "Look, it's not about love and money. Lifestyle. It's not lifestyle's a part of it." But I, I, I even say another point. Mm. I say that every single man a hot girl talks to has money. So it's not even a differentiator. Mm -hmm. It's like having arms. It's just one of the things that dudes have. They don't expect you to not have money. They don't respect your money because it's normal to just go on a thousand dollar dinner and the dude just pick it up. Yeah. Having money is not enough. Having money qualifies you to try. That's it. That allows you to try along with the other rich men. Unique but game. there ain't no baddie who ain't talking to a bunch of rich dudes. It really doesn't That's matter fact. that much. That's it's fact. just like they, we all can pick up the dinner. And, and there really ain't that much big a difference, truthfully, in lifestyle. There ain't really that big a difference between a guy with half a million in the bank and 20 million in the bank. Really? I mean, you go yeah. to dinner, you go to club. Like, so what are you going to do? Start sitting there showing your bank account, oh, I have a little bit more. Who gives a fuck, right? Everyone she's dating is going to pick up the tab. Yeah. Everyone she's dating has a nice car. Everyone she's dating is going to take it to the club. Everyone she's dating is going to pay for holidays. Everyone, So everyone's rich. So money is just a qualifier to try. It's not enough to, to capture a bad bitch. It's true, bro. It's just a so basic true. requirement. Like, like having arms and legs and a mouth. That's true. It's just part of the game, right? So it's getting harder and harder and harder. I'll give an example, right? I was a pimp. I'm a four-time kickboxing world champion. Six foot three. A multi-millionaire. Got a sexy bald head. Bugatti. Right. Bugatti. I've got Bugatti Chiron. Bugatti Sheesh. on the way. You fucking lame dudes must be getting wrecked. <laughs> because if I have to take shit off a hoe now and again, imagine how much shit you dudes are getting. Bro. It's fucking incredible. It's incredible. And I'm going to live, I'm going to make this very, very clear. I live without pity. I don't believe in pity for men. I really don't. Because Agreed. what you've done is you've made a conscious choice. You've decided being lazy is more important to you than having sexual access. Because as a man, it doesn't matter what you're born with. You can become what you want to be. You can become a superhero if you so choose. Yeah. And you chose not to. So all those nights you sat home, all those times you played video games, jerking off. all that shit you did jerking off the Pornhub, it all added up and it accumulated in you not getting any replies to your DMs. Mm. You fucking deserve it. You deserve it. This is the world. And the world is not fair or nice. This is human nature. So I absolutely enjoy my position, right? But it is getting harder and harder. And when guys come to me, I get a lot of guys mention me, hey, take you teach me game. The biggest game is being the G. Bam. The biggest game, the biggest game is being so legit you don't have to play games. I don't need game. I'm me. Right. So that's right. So you need to go be you. And I'll tell you something, man, because it's amazing to me. You're going to sit on Instagram, see all these beautiful women, the, 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 the 20 out of 10s that exist. And you know, they're fucking someone and you know, it's never going to be you. And you're still not going to try and become something. Then you deserve what you got. You deserve. It. Yeah, man. Uh, it's, it's, it's so true. Like, I mean, the, the thing is, is that women have more options than ever before. You can either cry about it or you can adapt and i always say it on this podcast is we don't sit here and complain about hypergamy we teach you guys how to circumvent it and become the best version of yourself and i agree with that as well because i've said it many times on the podcast people criticize me myron you don't have any game hey myron you don't really you don't know what you're doing with the lady da, 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 da. But shit, and i'm like i don't give a fuck because i'm more focused on myself and a byproduct is the women the problem is that these guys change their whole image and do all this extra shit to get girls, no, you should be doing all the extra shit to better yourself, and then the byproduct of bettering yourself is the girls, so that when you act a, a certain way, it's congruent, because me and you talked about this in detail as well. A woman needs to respect you first. 100%. And if you are how you are, you know, King Von, I am what I am, regardless of good game or not, it's authentic and more, it's authentic and more importantly, it's congruent. So yeah, I lose girls all the time. Some bitch told me earlier, you're misogynistic. 
from Instagram. I, I did some research on you and you're, you're misogynistic. You know what I did? Left that bitch on scene. I don't care. Yep. Yep. Fuck you, bitch. Like, yep. no one cares what you think. Like, yep. you go and you act yourself. And if girls don't like it, take it or fucking leave. I'm not going to sit there and plead like, oh, well, you know, you should get to know me. But it's like, whatever. I don't give a fuck. Scene. Move on. Next girl. And Who cares? You made a very good point. When you're a G and you have the money and you have the, I want to say, game for yourself, you are who you are. Yep. So I don't, you don't have to be some alpha. Like, for example, they say, oh, bro, you're not alpha. You're not in shape. Bro, this is who I am as, as an individual. I may make some jokes, some kind of funny, whatever, but this is my style. Authenticity is super important because yeah. females have intuition and they can smell if you're fake. Yeah. This is the problem that most game guys have. If you look at a lot of the game guys that, that, that just their entire life is dedicated to just pointless sex with random chicks. The reason for that is because if they even get a bad chick, even if they get a good chick with a good heart, they can't hold her down. Nope. Because if you have a good enough game, right, you're a liar. And then she sees through you after a few weeks and realizes you ain't shit. And she doesn't want to stay with you. So then you feel better by just spinning endless plates, whatever, whatever. So I know there's a lot of these guys who are in the game and stuff. I'm like, yeah, I banged this girl, that girl, that girl, that girl, that girl. I was in a different business. I wasn't interested in sleeping with a bunch of girls. I was interested in having girls obey me and love me. Bam. Because yeah. that's how I made my money for a long time. I want a soul. And, and to this day, it's the same thing. I like the idea. Look, you can call me a misogynist, misogynist all you want. I love women. If I'm sick, I don't call the boys. I call the chicks. I don't feel well. Come lay, you know, and a woman will come lay with your sick ass in bed, cook for you, clean for you, do all this. Women, women have a healing power. Every man to some degree needs some women in his life. And I want women who love me and who are loyal to me and who obey me. So when I talk to guys like teach me game, I was like, listen, you need to be a man worthy of respect because a woman needs to respect you to love you. Thanks. And the way a woman's going to respect you is one of you respect yourself and two of other men respect you. You're not just gonna be able to sit around being a piece of shit. And just think, just because you're born with a dick, you're going to instantly get respect from females who have unlimited choice. Damn. That is, that's stupid, right? That's absolutely stupid. And in spite of all these facts, some men are still remarkably lazy. Well, then you're going to live the reality that you've painted. You made your bed and you're going to live in it. That there's nothing else we can do for you. That's the reality of the world. You need to level up as a man. If any man who's watching this, it's not just money. It's not just being in shape. It's everything. It's life experience. It's pizzazz. It's having that famoose. It's the ability to tell a story. It's yoga fire. Can you yoga fire a bitch? I can. <laughs> Listen, if I frighten a bitch with yoga fire, she gets scared. I've seen it. I'll, I will I will play. I've got a street fighter machine in my house. I'll play street fighter with a bitch. Fuck her up. Right? Mm -hmm. And I'll turn to her and say, Listen, I can do that for real. And she'll kind of, <laughs> she'll kind of, she'll go, What? I'm like, Yoga fire. And she'll be like, <laughs> But then she'll look me in the eyes. She's like, Maybe, maybe he can do yoga. For maybe he can. <laughs> when you have a bitch look at you and she's actually half scared that you can throw fireballs from your hands, she's sucking dick. <laughs> for real. Because she respects me to the point where she's like, Maybe I don't, know, I don't know this guy can do everything else. He's got this fucking mansion and shit. I don't know. What maybe what can he maybe take and do yoga fire? Yeah. But my point is that's what the game is. The game is all about respect. And it's not even just about men and women. Society has always been this way. Since the dawn of time, since the dawn of human time, there used to be kings sitting somewhere in the Roman Empire sending a letter on the back of a horse to Africa, threatening a motherfucker. And someone in Africa would read it and go, shit, I heard this guy's legit. Mm. You know what I'm Put saying? Yeah. So the world has always been about respect as a man. You need to be respected. And you're only going to be respected if you do things that people respect. And most of the time, those things are on the other side of fear. We talk about the world we live in today and the problem with girls, et cetera, et cetera. The real problem with the world is that there is an epidemic of cowardice. Men. Men are cowards. Yeah. We have an epidemic of cowardice. Everybody is so fucking afraid. It's on the other side of fear that you're going to garner the respect of other individuals. You have to do things that they're afraid to do, meaning most likely you are also afraid. I've done a bunch of shit. I was afraid. I was afraid 87 times before I got in the ring and cage. It's scary, right? I lived a scary life. But by going through all of that, I am now respected. You have to learn to face your fear. I'm not saying be, I'm not saying not be afraid because that's not brave. If you do something and you're not afraid, you're not brave. You have to be afraid and do it anyway. That's what courage is. So I'm not saying you can be as scared as you want, but you still have to go. This also ties into how, why you need to create your reality. I'll give you an example, man. Everybody around me is brave. I don't hang around with cowards. You have to understand that I've created my reality to the point now where I can only make the bravest decision because everybody I speak to is brave. There's no bitchness in my realm. I'm rich enough that everybody I correlate my existence with, everybody I conversate with is saying, do the brave thing. There's literally no realm for being a coward. So how can I be the only coward in my peer group? 
I'm not going to be the only pussy amongst all the men I talk to. No. They say you're some of the five people you spend the most time with. So even if you're sitting here right now and you know you're a little bitch, why are you not hanging around with brave men? Because there's a magical power amongst men. And it's, it's a magical power which has been forgotten and lost. When you put enough men in the same room, there's a transference of energy that makes us feel invincible. I say all the time, your friends should bring out the worst in you. And when I say the worst, I mean, you know, when you're with your boys and you're loud and you feel aggressive and you're about it and you'll talk to that bitch. Who cares if she says no? They bring out the worst in you because you don't give a fuck anymore. Because what used to happen evolutionarily is when large groups of men got together, you charged at the enemy. That's what you did. You ran at the spears. Even in World War I, World War II, they ran at machine guns screaming over the trenches. When men get together, there's a magical force that makes us feel brave, makes us feel powerful. So you should be around other men that make you feel that way. There ain't a bitch alive who can drag me down. You can't make me sad. I'm with my, with my team. Then I'm gonna go up to my boys and go, well, you know, she had nice tits, man. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So most of these pussies are hanging around pussies wondering why they're pussies. You deserve it. You need to create your reality. You don't even need to be brave enough to become brave by yourself. You need to be around men who are already brave. And you need to have enough self-respect to not embarrass yourself like Tommy Fury, like a little punk. You understand what I'm saying? You need to stick to the game. But this is the truth of the world we live in now. We live in a world full of cowardice. It's cowardice. Let me tell you about the best player I ever met. I've ever, told you about, I've ever told you about Luke the Man? No. Oh, you know about Luke the Man? Yes, yes, yes. Luke the Man. The story. Luke the Man. Okay. Right. Luke the man was the best player in history, right? He was ugly. So ugly. He was from the Ivory Coast Republic. African guy. African guy. Spoke no English. Fresh off the boat. Bluetooth headset. Flip-flops in the winter. Fresh? Fresh. Let's go here, bro. Fresh. fresh. Listen. We, we used to call him fresh. <laughs> Sorry. Because we were like, because we were like, you're fresh off the boat, bro. When did you get off the boat? Because he used to wear flip-flops. It was like, it's freezing cold. Like the fucking video. We're like, why are you wearing flip-flops? We also talk to you, man. Uh -huh. Give me a break. So my brother used to work in, in back in the poor days, my brother used to work in, in Pret, which is a sandwich store like a mcdonald's in england right yeah. and luke the man used to work the till mm -hmm. and every time a beautiful girl would come to the till luke the man would say hey baby you're such a beautiful girl and he'd talk to her and say you are so beautiful this is this is for you this is a present from luke the man and he'd just give her her order so i don't know what the present <laughs> was bro. It was just her or you ordered coffee here's your coffee it's a present but you still had to pay for it so he used to pretend he was giving her something and he used to mack it on Every girl. When I say every girl, please do not underestimate every single girl. woman. E even those not, even old, those fat, <laughs> young, hot, didn't make if you were a female between the age of 18 and probably 48, he tried. Even those fat bitches that interviewed you. All of them. Yeah. <laughs> even the police officer Dykes, he would have tried. He was Luke the man. And and I knew him because I used to go see my brother at work and I say, Luke, why do you talk to like all like all of them? Some of them are not even hot. And he had the most African reply. He goes to me. I'm a businessman. I got business plans. What does that even mean? <laughs> Don't even mean anything. Anyway, so he was doing this for a long time. Me and Tristan used to make fun of Luke the Man. It's like Luke the Man thinks he's a G, but we used to make fun of him. Make fun of him all the time. Then one day, about after five months of Luke the Man's bullshit, he came in one day with naked pictures of a, a seven. She wasn't hot. She was a seven. Yeah. But Luke the Man's a two. He works in a sandwich store. He doesn't speak English. He has flip-flops on. And he banged this seven. And he was showing me and Tristan with delight. I am Luther man, businessman, business plans, businessman, <laughs> scrolling through his phone. And me and Tristan were like, you actually fucked that bitch, didn't you? He's like, yeah, I'm Luther man. Of course I fucked that. And we were like, we realized. He know, he just, pure numbers game. He didn't give a fuck. Yeah. Ruthless. He was just ruthless about it. What did he have? He didn't have shit but bravery. Mm -hmm. All he had, still got himself some pussy. And I guarantee there is not a single person watching this podcast today who is not already in a better position than Luke the man. But I will also guarantee you there ain't a single person watching this podcast today who's approached as many bitches as <laughs> Luke the man. <laughs> Bravery will take you pretty fucking far. Yeah. You're right? And that's what most of these people are missing. Because if you're truly brave, if you're truly brave, you'll have results in and of itself. But you'll also have all the motivation you need to upgrade your character to then have fantastic results. Because, man, I can keep talking. Should I keep talking? Keep going. I'll keep talking. As a man. Let me get some vodka. Sorry. As a man, I say we're living inside the matrix and we are, but you know what we're really doing? We're living inside of a video game, right? I get, you know, people say to me all the time, people go, you remind me of Tyler Durden. 
because you inspire me to like, you know, live my life or you remind me of Morpheus because you're trying to like wake me up. I get all these different things. Or you look like a GTA character when I'm running around with my machine gun and my gun my, in Romania and my, my Ferrari, whatever, whatever. Yeah. But we do live in a video game because in a video game, you're going to go through trial and tribulation. You're going to struggle to upgrade your character. And the reason you upgrade your character is when you get more stats, you can complete more difficult levels within the game. Life is exactly the same. The levels never end, but as you become better, you stand a better chance of completing them. That's what we were talking about money earlier, saying that, oh, you need, if you have money, you get girls. Yeah. Well, if you have money, you might get stupid girls. But if you want the baddest, baddest, baddest bitch, money is just going to allow you to start that level. That's all it is. You still got to do the work. Yep. You still got to have everything else on top. You still got to be fitter than the other rich guys, smarter than the other rich guys, right. more funny than the other rich just guys. Just allows you to compete. Just allows you to compete. That's it. So as you upgrade your character, you get further and further in the game, but the game never ends. That's the beauty of being a man. Mm -hmm. All these men are out here complaining, complaining that things are difficult. The reason it has value is because it's difficult. If it was easy, everyone would have it and it wouldn't have any value. Plain that it's hard to get a Lambo. The reason having a Lambo is cool is because nobody has a Lambo. You know what pisses me off when I'm in my Lambo? Seeing another one. It upsets me. I was like, no, no, get, I'm the G. Fresh, true or false? That's true. Fresh, get off the road, bro. I'm driving now. You understand? So if everyone had a Lambo, I wouldn't even want one. The fact that it's difficult, the fact that it's hard to do is the reason it has a value in the first place. Yeah. How are you going to complain that it's hard to be the man, but then also understand that being the man has value? They are linked. You cannot separate the two. It's a logic fail. If you love the fact, if you love the idea of being that character you dream of yourself to be, then you should love the fact it's hard to become that man because it means no one else can do it. I, th this is what I love. I love everything about my life. I know the shit I've been through to become who I am. And I wouldn't trade a second of it because there's also this massive juxtaposition, which is so important for masculine happiness and contentment. I'll tell you the coolest thing about being rich because I'm a little bit rich now, a little bit. The coolest thing about being rich is remember when I was broke. Mm. That's all it is. Having money in and of itself really isn't that interesting. No, it's not. You buy the house, you buy the car, you buy the watches, you buy some clothes, blah, blah. It's boring. It's only cool to sit there with my brother in the fucking nurse re restaurant with Salt Bay being an idiot, <laughs> spending 15 G's and saying, do you remember when Stories. We, do you remember when we didn't have a penny? Right. 15 grand for dinner? We never had 15 grand in our savings account in our lives. Bam. Do you remember that time we were living off those 10 P packs of noodles for two weeks? Do you remember? You need this juxtaposition. There is no light without dark. You will not appreciate your six pack unless you didn't have one and you had to earn it. That's how the world works. So when I talk to these dudes like, oh, but it's, you know what, Tate? Yeah, I agree. But you know, it's hard. It's hard. Of course it is. It's supposed to be. And if you're not cut out for it, then, then fuck off and live a normal existence and die. Sit there, letting other men enjoy the spoils of being a man and fucking die. If that's what you want to do is just sit there and exist and then be fade into history unremembered. That's your decision. If you want to level up your character, then you need to get out here and do it. You need to be around brave men. You need to get some balls. You need to get your network together. You need to be paying attention to things like the Fresh and Fit podcast. Listen to the truth. Humble yourself. Stop sitting there with an ego. Realize you ain't shit. Most of you fuckers could go look in the mirror right now. And if you were totally honest with yourself, go look in the mirror and be honest with yourself and say, if I was a hot bitch, would I fuck me? And the answer for most of you is no. So you can't be mad at women. They've got eyes. They see the same shit you see right now. And they just don't. The answer is fucking no. You ain't got shit worth fucking, my friend. Mm. When they look at me, they're like, okay. Yeah, all right, fuck it. It is what it is. That's the game. But I made myself this way. I wasn't born this way. I absolutely not really made myself this way. And any single one of you men out here can do the same thing. I don't want to plug too hard, but inside the war room, this is what we teach. The war room is the only organization in the world in which we kick out members every single month. Mm. Every other membership club, every other group you can join, you can pay your money, you can sit around and pretend you're getting progress, right? It's like signing up to a gym. They'll take your membership even if you never go. Facts. Not the war room. Myron has a link to the war room on here. And you'll learn inside the war Down room below. that there are things you must do. You must complete tasks to succeed and survive. If you do not survive, you are kicked. Because I refuse to have cowardice around me. It's my organization. Everyone else in there, the thousands of men in there, think and act and work hard like I do. We're not having no pussy fucking holding on to coattails. That's what the war room's about. 
The war room's about that bravery and that male competition. It's impossible to be in a highly competitive environment and massively fail like most of these dudes are failing. I'm telling you now, I have zero sympathy for most of you guys because the lives you live are the lives you have built for yourselves. You've built it for yourself from head to toe. You're nothing but lucky. Bacteria could have stole your eyesight at the age of three, and it didn't. You could have been in a car crash and lost both your parents. Never happened. You've been nothing but lucky. Blind luck has given you a favorable hand, and you've managed to fuck it up. And then you want to message me and ask, how do I get pussy? You don't deserve any fucking pussy. Damn. I deserve it all. So fuck you. <laughs> it's your own fault. I need some more vodka, G. Yo, Let's get man. Some Yo, the fire, fire, man. Holy Here's the thing, guys. Uh, awesome rant, by the way. Watch the movie, Troy. Brad Pitt's about to go fight off, fight this big ass dude in in a, in a little one on one co uh, confrontation, and the boy gives Brad Pitt, you know Troy, his weapons or whatever, and he says, "Wow, he's rather large. I wouldn't fight him." Brad Pitt looks at that fucking kid and he goes, "That's why no one will remember your name," and he rides off. That's right. And he fights that fucking dude. That's right. And that's what I need you guys to understand is that you know, there's nothing wrong with being scared. As a matter of fact, being scared is what keeps you alive. It's what makes you human. Hundred percent. You know what I'm saying? But it's accepting the fact that you're scared and doing it fucking anyway. Just That's like right. when it comes to the gym. I don't feel like going to the gym. I'm tired. You do it fucking anyway. You're tired. You don't want to work. You want to go to sleep and just relax. You do it fucking anyway. And, and, and sorry to interrupt again, no, but, that's, but that, that is the basic, that is the most basic imperative of the masculine frame, which has been destroyed in real time. They are trying to convince you that you should act how you feel. You should show more of your feelings. If you feel this way, you should show it. If you want to cry, cry. Look, I have no problem with guys crying. Sometimes guys cry, right? My dad died. I cried. I've, I've cried once in 10 years, but it's not a default emotion for me. Sometimes you cry, right? But what I'm saying is the reason they're trying to bring out emotionality in you is because of exactly what Myron said. Most of the time, you don't feel like doing the things you're supposed to do. But the true masculine frame throughout history was doing the things they didn't want to do, but they knew they had to do because they had honor and duty. That's what honor and duty means. Do you think the men on the Titanic wanted to stay on the fucking Titanic? No, we're men. We have to stay. We're scared, but we must. It's our duty to let the women and children on the lifeboats. Yeah. This is masculine duty. When you remove self-control from men, you get, not only do you get emasculated weak men, but what you also get is very dangerous men. Because the world at large is trying to tell you, just be more in touch with your feelings and everything's going to be fine. Men also have an innate desire, one, for conquest, and two, we have a biological response. We are very predispositioned to anger. You look at all these school shooters and shit. These are men who can't control their emotions. That's yeah. all they are. Facts. They have no self-control. And then they go and do dangerous shit. A good man controls himself. I have absolute self-control. If I decide to smash your face in, it was a very conscious decision. Nothing to do with the fact I was angry. If I decide to shoot you in the face, it's a conscious decision. It's the best move on the chessboard. There's no anger involved. You understand? Emotional control is absolutely and utterly important as a man. Now, I'm not saying become a stoic dork, have no personality, be a boring fuck. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that you need to understand as a man, there are certain principles under which you act regardless of how you feel. Bam. I can wake up in a terrible mood. To, I don't believe in depression, so I'll use a different We'll talk word. about depression here in a second, guys. I can wake up sad. I can ache. I can have a, a busy day, stressed, etc. I will complete the same tasks as if I woke up in a fantastic mood. I'll do the same things because how I feel has no bearing on the things I'm going to do with my day because I have duty to myself and to my bloodline. So a lot of you guys out here are acting like fools because you feel like acting like fools. And what I'm going to say to you is, because you think there's something wrong with you. You go, well, I don't, I lack motivation. You hear this one? I don't have the motivation to go to the gym. Well, here's the news flash. Neither did I. And I still did it. So now what are you going to say? Now you have no excuse, right? Yep. Mm. Oh, you're scared to get in the ring. So was I. I still did it. Scared to get in the cage. So was I. I still did it. Being a man isn't about not feeling things. It's about acting the way you're supposed to act, regardless of how you feel. This once again ties into your network, the people around you. If everyone else around you, when you say you feel a certain way, if they don't check you, then why are you hanging around with them? Facts. If you're going to sit there and go, I feel sad, and your friends are going to go, oh, bro, you feel sad, man? Sorry to hear that, bro. It's hard to be sad, bro. You're sad, bro? Oh, we're sad too, bro. I was sad last week. Uh -huh. 
What the fuck's wrong with you? I can't even. Tristan, I feel sad. I'm like, shut up. You know, my, my boys around me, there is no weakness in my circle. Yeah. You need to create your reality. You got to keep this in mind. I'm tired of hearing guys message about how they feel. I don't feel motivated. I don't feel. Feel, 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 feel. Leave the feelings to the girls, right? That's what they do. We act. We're men of action. We get things done. So the world got built. All of it. All the men who built the fucking skyscrapers felt scared. They did it anyway. You need to become a man of action. Stop worrying about how you feel and start worrying about what you're supposed to be doing. How about that? So, Andrew, you went viral uh, for saying depression isn't real. Correct. And um, everyone came at you. J.K. Rowling, yep. the author of Harry Potter, LOL. Those that, books that up. Fat bitch. Yeah, yeah fat bitch. <laughs> uh, you, you had a bunch of people, media outlets uh, in the U.K., the United States, covering you. Yep. Saying, uh, this man, Andrew Tate, yep. kickboxer. Yep. Misogynist, toxic yep. masculinity. Ah, yep. it says depression isn't real. And we actually got a clip here. Uh, Chris, if we could pull it up here. Let's play it. Um, where we brought a guy on, you know, shout out to Skippy. Uh, we brought him on the show and we talked about, you know, I, I asked him a few questions because prior to this, obviously it was a clip from this, from when we talked to him, but he told us about how he's 40 plus years old, or I think he's in his late thirties, early forties, uh, virgin, never been with a girl, lives with his mom, works about 10 hours per week, overweight, doesn't go to the gym. And um, I asked him this simple question. I got a lot of heat for this, too, because I share your views on this as well. And we're going to have uh, Andrew give his take on it because Andrew's very well traveled. Been to what? 70 plus countries? 72. 72 countries. Bam. Skippy. Right? Skippy. Where do you live? Ogden, Utah. OK. You live in the United States? Yes. OK. Do you have running water? Yes. You have electricity? Mm -hmm. You have food in the fridge? Yeah. OK. You got nothing to be depressed about. There's children right now that don't even have clothes, that don't have food that don't have anything. Only in the West do we have this, this notion that, oh man, it's so tough. Oh my God, I'm sad. I don't know how I feel. The problem is this. You're looking at what you don't have instead of looking at what you do have. Yes. And you're making excuses for your inadequacies, okay? All I hear is wah, 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 fucking wah, bro. And the thing is, is that you've gotten away with doing this for your entire adult life because no one's told you the truth. All right. You and, nailed it. Uh, I got a lot of heat for that, guys. Wh and why he said he's depressed. Why did he get away with it? Because his circle's full of cowards. That's why he got that. away with it. He's going to sit there and say that he's fat and, and unsuccessful and lonely because he's depressed. The truth is he's depressed because he's fat, unsuccessful, and lonely. Yeah. Mm. That's what's actually happened. I, it's absolutely incredible to me that people will go through life and defend this dehabilitating disease, right? They'll stick up for depression because it's a cure-all excuse. It's their excuse to not try very hard and they can pull it out in a bag. Well, look, I'm depressed. I said on the last show, on the, I'll actually tell you why I'm calling myself Dalsim recently. <laughs> on the last show, on the last show, there's a clip. If you watch my last one-on-one -on -one interview and I talked about two men in haunted houses. Yeah. And I said that depression, you can only become clinically depressed if you believe in depression. I'm not saying you cannot feel depressed. I'm not saying you cannot feel sad. I'm not saying bad things won't happen to you. I'm not saying every day is sunshine and fucking rainbows. I'm saying the mindset that you enter, like Skippy, that you are depressed and you can do nothing about it and it can't be fixed, is accepting clinical depression as a disease. If you accept it exists, then it can damage you, right? If I become sad, I know there will be a day where I'm no longer sad. But if I become sad and I believe in depression, then I'm going to sit there and go, maybe I'm going to feel this way forever. Mm. I can't help this. Right. On the line, it says that I have something wrong with my brain chemistry. It says that everybody feels depressed and it can't be fixed. It says I need to take a bunch of pills. It says I need to go to the therapist. It says I'm going to have, and you start to believe in it and it gets worse. It's the belief which gives it power. I gave an example last time I was on this show. I said, you take two men, both in haunted houses. One believes in ghosts, one doesn't. There's the same noise in the night. The one who believes in ghosts starts crying his eyes out. Now he's scared of ghosts, wants an exorcist, and they're in bed panicking. The guy who doesn't believe in ghosts says wind and goes back to sleep. Same noise. The reason one of them is being tormented is because of his belief. By absolute coincidence, when I was busting a bitch up at Street Fighter, <laughs> I won as Dalsim. And Dalsim had a win quote. Yeah. His win quote was this. My flame was only an illusion. It burned you because you believed. Wow. Mm. If that's not saying the exact same thing I just said about the ghost, the exact same thing, 
Dalsim's been giving out free game since the 90s. <laughs> You've been there playing Super Nintendo, and you're still a bitch when Dalsim was telling you the realities of Earth. My flame is but an illusion. It burnt you because you believed. Damn. Now that fucker believes so strictly in depression that there is nothing you can do to change his mind to prevent him from finding depression. You could even give him a fantastic life. He would still sit there talking about depression because it's all he sees because it's all he believes in. For the same reason why certain people who believe in ghosts, all they see is ghosts everywhere they seem to fucking go. I do not see the point in believing in things that will steal power from me. I curate my own reality. My reality is self-constructed, and I've constructed a reality in which I have all the tools I need to be as powerful as possible. I'm not going to believe in things that take my power. This is the world I live in. I'm me. I see the world through my eyes. And in my version of Earth, in my human experience, which is unique amongst every person, we all live a human experience. In my human experience, I cannot be damaged by the invisible. I have real enemies in the real world. You see me. I took a blade. My finger came off. I people try to kill me. You think I'm going to sit around worried about being sad? I got shit going on for real. That young man has decided. He made a decision to give his power away. And then he's going to sit there and complain he has no power. Yeah. Depression is absolutely not really a choice. Now, I'm going to say one more thing. Please do. If you have PTSD, you went to war, something really bad happened to you. If you have a genuine mental condition like schizophrenia, blah, blah, blah. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about these people with perfectly happy lives. Nothing bad's happened to them. Pulling out this depression card. And it doesn't even make sense. Listen, if depression is a disease that can't be helped, that is irrespective of outside stimuli. Because my argument is pretty simple. Outside stimuli cause depression. If you live a depressing, depressing life, you will be depressed. Crazy, I know. Call J.K. Rowling. Tate said if you live a depressing life, you're going to be depressed. Because you fucking are, right? My argument is that it's outside stimuli. People say to me, that's not true. It's brain chemistry. You can't help it. It strikes out of nowhere. If that's true, dickheads, why is it not universal across the human condition? If it strikes out of nowhere and outside stimuli have no part to play, why are some countries more depressed than others? Mm. Explain why some countries have no depression and some countries have a bunch of depression. Explain that one. Maybe because in some countries, all we do is talk about depression and fucking promote it. Bam. And in some countries, we don't. Right. If it really struck and was completely independent of outside stimuli, it should be a universal phenomenon. But it's fucking not. The whole thing. The reason it's promoted, it's the same reason anything else in the modern world is promoted. They will never promote anything unless it detriments masculine imperative. The reason that depression is promoted is because it allows you to become ultimately selfish, live inside of your mind, become obsessed with me, me, me. I'm sad. I'm sad. I'm sad. So you don't pay enough attention to what's going on around you to realize you're getting fucked by a ruling class who don't give a shit. That's all it is. Nothing in this world is promoted unless it is bad for you. Every single thing that you're going to find on nearly anywhere in the world is going to be promoted because it is detrimental to your psyche. You must resist the slave mind. If you took two versions of me, clone me today, Andrew Tate, give me another clone. I've had enough bad shit happen to me, ladies and gentlemen. My life's not been fucking roses. My life's not been peachy. The version of me that you see in front of you right now is the man who doesn't believe in depression. If you took the same man with all my accolades and skills and you put him next to me and he did believe in depression, I would guarantee you I have out-succeeded him. I would guarantee you I've outperformed a clone of me who believes in depression. So why the fuck am I going to believe in something that's going to take my own power from me? Mm -hmm. And anyone who sits here and tells me, well, depression's real. I believe in it. It's actually real. It's actually real. You're telling me that your mindset is weak and I'm not going to adopt the thinking of weaklings. You can go cry about depression by yourself. I'm busy living fucking life. And that right there ooh, was perfectly said because, <laughs> Man. yeah, I mean, people in the West are very, uh, dude, you go to Africa, you go to these poor ass countries, They're happy. all over the world. They're, They're fucking happy. happy. Yeah. Yo, in Barbados, everyone's partying, getting lit, having fun. <laughs> depression? What is that? It's only here in the West where we have the best access to medical care. We have the best technology. We have the best life, right? Like quality of life in the West, right? Oh my God, I'm sad. Oh, I'm watching porn in 1080p. I'm not going outside. I'm not working out. And life sucks. I got all this food, by the way. And it's an abundance. And this water is really clean. But fuck it. I'm sad. 
And it's like, listen, man, shut the fuck up and stop crying. Yeah. Seriously, bro. Yeah. And if that's true, immigrants that come to the U.S. or come to the U.K. and they come make it big, how is that possible? But yeah. it's also, as it was, besides all the points I've just made, yeah. the reason, I'll tell you the reason Skippy will even come on a podcast and talk about this shit. Yeah. When you're an extremely unrem unremarkable person, it's a very easy grasp at originality. Mm. Mm. Oh, well, I'm, I, I've got this and this and this, and you can't understand me because I have this very unique set of these weird conditions that you couldn't understand. It's a grasp for individuality because yeah. most most forms of individuality are difficult to acquire, like yeah. we talked earlier, right? Yeah. Being in good shape, having money, all these things to be an individual, to stand out are difficult. Sitting around talking about all the diseases you have is not difficult and allows you to pretend you're an individual. So it's a grasp for individuality. And it's, 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 it's an attention play. It's an it's, attention play. It's automatic sympathy as well. And I want to say this is. real quick too, guys, just so y'all know, this is not a shot of Skippy. We love Skippy. I actually hit him up and I said, hey man, follow up with me. He never responded to me. I was like, I'm going to help you get in shape. Yeah. He didn't respond to me. But I didn't play that video to attack Skippy. I played that video to show you guys that too many people are concerned with what they don't have versus what they do have. And he's just an example of that. But that's nothing to do with him. And we got a lot of hate on that video. Yeah. Oh, Martin, you're insensitive. Oh, da, 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 da. And all it did was just establish to me that here in the West, we're extremely coddled. People are soft. Yep. And quite frankly, we're looking at the things we don't have versus what we do have. And I'm not going to sit there and have that, bro, because I've been to third world countries. I've been to Sudan. I've been to Egypt. I've been to extremely yep. poor countries. Yep. And over there, they're happier with less, yep. right, than they are over here. Yep. Over here, we manufacture a bunch of bullshit excuses for why we're fat, why we're obese, why we're sad, why we live a shitty life, why we don't have money, why we don't, don't get girls, et cetera. Yep. Unacceptable. Sure. Nailed it. Um, right. Cool. I'll read these yeah. chats real yes. quick. And got, then uh, we, got, we got a girls here. And we got some of the lovely ladies here, guys. They're all here right now. Uh, right, hold cool. Shit, they've been listening to some, to some heat then. Uh, oh, sorry, ladies. <laughs> I promise I'll talk nicer when I have girls here. You know, I'll calm down. I'll be a gentleman. <laughs> She's already looking at me like, I don't like this guy. He's lying. Uh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah Read out well, G Talk quickly. Well, he ran into me today at Clive's. I hit Clive's by myself. Yo, uh, bro. Okay. Yeah, I, I, yeah, 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 yeah. Cool guy. Cool guy. Ran yeah. Into Tate at Clive's restaurant today. Cool guy. Appreciate the show. Yo, Always. What'd you F order? Bro, I had, to get the, I had to get jerk chicken. I got to bring the fire, bro. I can't be coming here on white boy food. Yeah. You understand? <laughs> I got to bring the fire. All right, guys. All right, cool. Um, So, real quick, we got these uh, questions. We'll answer them fast. Yep. Hey, Tate, looking at getting some nice suits. What do you recommend? And that's from uh, 115. It's hard for Australia? me to say. It's hard for me to say because it depends what you look like. But uh, you only need one or two nice suits. So what I would say is buy expensive ones. Buy one or two nice ones as opposed to a bunch of cheap ones. Nice. Buy a nice suit. I agree on that. This, this is – this is. I think this is Armani. Armani. This, yeah, this Armani is like – this is four or five Gs. This is a T-shirt. It was a G. Like I, I, I wear 10, 11 grand on what I'm wearing. But I only have three or four nice suits most of the time. Right. Okay, deal Saint. Uh, he goes, I could buy uh, – I could go to a jewelry store, but I'm using Fresh Guy because I believe in my network, Fresh and Fit. He's asking, Brother Tate, how important is it to spend money within your circle? Absolutely important because life is a value exchange. Life is a value exchange. The more value you give to people around you, the more value you're going to get back. So people you have a personal relationship with, I always do business with people I have a personal relationship with. Yeah. And I never haggle them. Never. If you're my friend, I do not want a discount. I want full price. I don't care if you're more expensive, right? You have to keep your network strong. And it's better to provide value to people who are close enough to you to be able to provide value back. Bam, bam. And then uh, Night Zero here, uh, good question. And Taste Speech, you said you were an atheist, but now you talk about believing in God. What was the catalyst that made you change your mind? That's a really good question. And to answer it succinctly, without going into too much detail, what made me change my mind, when I said I was an atheist, I always still had some belief in a higher power. Mm -hmm. I now identify myself as a, a religious man because in the last three to four years, I may not have seen much of God, but I've seen plenty of the devil. Mm -hmm. And if one exists, the other must exist. I've seen pure evil play out in front of us. And for that reason, I truly believe the world needs God. I believe the trouble we're in today, whether it's the God of Islam or Christianity, we need some kind of intervention. Whether it's men who believe in God standing up in unison, that's a form of God in and of itself. God as an idea can be powerful, let alone a person in the sky, right? Mm -hmm. My point is that God is now needed in society. What did I say 10 minutes ago? I do not believe in things that take power from me. If I believe, that we need God, then I believe in God. Yeah. Uh, ben, uh, ben Andre, last one. What do you think about the webcam industry in Romania? Yeah, it's a popular industry over there. I don't know what you want good to internet. say. Good internet, now it makes sense. Yeah, it's got good internet. Girls who are all about their money, hustlers. It's a good industry. And, and webcam as a whole really isn't a bad job for a girl. I know we have this idea that a lot of girls who do OnlyFans are thoughts and that kind of thing. In the West, that's possibly true. But in, in Romania, I can tell you there's a bunch of women who are happily married with kids. And they just think, you know what? There's no point going to a job for 500 euro a month. 
when I could sit at home on a computer and make two or three thousand a month from mm. my house. So there's a lot of relatively wholesome women who just making money. That's it is what it is. All right. All right. Yeah.